Hello and welcome to another episode of the Cryptid Ramblers podcast. As always, I'm Callum from Essex in England. And thankfully, back with me is my co-host and partner in crime, Scott, also from Essex, England. How you doing, man? Welcome hello, back. hello. <laughs> ah, thank you very much. Uh, I feel great to actually be back, indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. Glad to have you back. Yeah, but I, <laughs> it I'm, wasn't mate, I must say, it was, um, it, it was a bit rough. I'm not going to lie about that. It was yeah, a bit no, rough. Yeah, um, insane, although yeah. I must say as well that it's unconfirmed that I had the Rona. It is unconfirmed. The amount of tests that I had. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, I did go for a PCR as well. Oh, right. Okay. And even that came back as negative. So. Oh, wow. Okay. I don't know. All I know is that it felt like the flu. Right. Um, and uh, I was it just had legs on it, you know. It just kept yeah, yeah. just kept, kept running going. me down, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah it's like I like I, I, I hit a, hit a trough with it. Started yeah. feeling a bit better about three days in, yeah. and then it hit me again, yeah. and I was like, then a slow incline, but it was a bit all back to one hundred percent now. So, Excellent. Well, yeah, this back is where and, they'll tell uh, you ready and there. raring. Well, exactly. Yeah, this is where they'll tell you that there are, you know, such a thing as. Uh, False negatives now, probably as opposed to oh yeah, false positives. But <laughs> well, the positive is if I've got it, then hopefully my Bad immune is. system's bit. Yeah, my immune system knows it now. Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, now, some of you will know um, we took a, a little break uh, last time from uh, Helia, Kentucky, uh, of course, in Scott's absence, um, and spent some time in Centralia, Pennsylvania. Um, firstly, thank you to everyone who listened to who has listened to that episode so far. Um, the response has been great as always, so um, yeah, it's much appreciated. Um, this time, you'll be glad to know we do return to Helia for part two of our coverage uh, and to dive deeper into the strange goings on. Um, now, spoiler alert! Uh, but with the sheer amount of information and events that the the team uncover and experience. Um, we've decided that this will be a three-part series. Um, yeah. Mostly for time constraints, but also because there is just so much information. We didn't want any of it to get kind of lost or pushed to the side or sort of diluted in any way, because there is just so much to, to bring mm. to, you know, to sort of to you guys. And, and I suppose importantly, or more importantly, there's so much for us to sort of digest and get our heads around. So I think we need that oh, kind of week, two-week period in between to actually uh, prepare for <laughs> yeah, it. A, that is the truth of it. It really is because yeah. you, you hit a point in, in this season two where I had to go – I had just, to pretty much watch the whole thing <laughs> twice because it was just yeah. – the the way it just goes boom and it's off again in a the same yeah. way that you start off with season one and yes. – you know, it's it's a goblin hunt, and yeah, yeah, they're working through to finding out these all these details about these goblins and whatnot, and then it just goes way out. It on just left goes field. left field on you, and yeah, you don't you don't necessarily, you know, sort of um, expect it, but uh, yeah, no. it's just one of those where you, you sort of watch it the first time for fun and to kind of enjoy it and and to have that experience, and mm. then certainly for us, there's that at, at least second time of watching because that's where you hone in on on you know our notes and you know, just remembering stuff that happened that you may have missed on the mm. first glance and yeah, just having to rewatch things so you can actually get your head around it and actually kind of start adding some context and yeah, just kind of try and figure it out for Well, you know, yeah, for yourself, absolutely. I mean, really. like, the, so, the, like what we were talking about in part one where the importance of the synchronicities and yeah. how we both watched it first time round and yeah. it didn't I, I think I didn't, didn't quite say it properly the first time round was that when I watched Helia for the first time, it was I enjoyed it for what it was. Yeah, that it was something strange. I didn't mm. quite understand everything that was going on, but certainly since we've started doing our podcast and all the research yeah. we've done for the previous episodes, it's like it has really has opened up so much more understanding. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. Certainly for me, that's for me for more sure, so. I, mean, I would say because we'll see, we you know we both know what I was. Yeah, we've, we've spoken. Yeah, we've, we've said we dropped that. this a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mr. Skeptic over there. Exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> like, fuck it, bollocks, mate. Absolute nonsense. Yeah. But, but honestly, but that's why I couldn't <laughs> actually watch um, beyond uh, episode one of Hellier, season one, because yeah. I was watching it and thought, come on. I mean, what I suppose what didn't help was 
I did listen to obviously our, our bros in uh, Not Another Conspiracy. I listened to their podcast yep. first. Uh, and obviously they have a certain viewpoint on it and whatever. So I watched that, uh, listened to that, sorry. And I think in doing so, that kind of, I almost let that influence my opinion before I actually watched it. And so I got to the first yeah. episode in and just thought, nope, <laughs> not for me. <laughs> just kind of left Drop it. Drop me um, out. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. me gone. But then, as you say, you know, jumping into this podcast, not just about Helia, but right from, you know, episode one, it's kind of helped me. Well, it's opened my, my mind and, and whatever to, to a lot of stuff that before I would never have imagined, you know, kind of believing in or e- even really given the time of day to. But um, yeah, yeah, that that's all in turn helped, you know, as uh, as you say. So um, yeah, the, it's the still second surprising watch, me, mate. Still surprising <laughs> me, mate. To be honest with you, still it's, surprising me. <laughs> it's absolute. Yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> it's yeah. uh, is is really is crazy. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's going to be uh, going to be a three part. So we'll cover obviously part two. Uh, in this uh, episode. Uh, but before we dive back into uh, all things Helia, just uh, a few announcements, if we may. Um, as people may have seen, we recently launched a Patreon. Um, this is an opportunity for anyone who enjoys the podcast to basically support us, you know, in all honesty, yeah. not just through the, you know, the listens and the likes on the, you know, the socials, which are all, you know, much appreciated. But uh, in all honesty, this is the financial support, which, uh, you know, I guess we're now sort of um, asking for really. Yeah. Um, and because yeah, I was going to say, because we, we, it's like we're, we want to progress this into, um, we probably, can, we're definitely really. certainly more, more professional equipment. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. More so than, than gaming, gaming headsets, headsets. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the webcam that I'm having to use on my laptop and all that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, so I, that's something that I think is, is, you know, we'd very much appreciate if you, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we'd love for you yeah. guys to actually support us on this. If you enjoy the content that we're providing for you, mm. then we would ask you to help us and support us through, uh, through our yeah. journey and essentially our journey and your journey. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, the contributions will basically help us to not only continue bringing you the, the, the content that we are, but also, the quality, you know, as, as Scott says, you know, we can upgrade from our, you know, PlayStation headsets to, you know, <laughs> things like actual microphones, headphones, you know, filters and, you know, and the like. Um, and uh, yeah, so it will help the, the quality, not not just bring in the, uh, you know, the, uh, the content. Um, and on that note, um, all things Patreon, it's, uh, it's worth, or we want to just throw out a, uh, a special thanks to our first uh, patron, um, MK Ultra, uh, as he's uh, MK Ultra going on there. So this is a special shout out for him. Yeah. Um, thank you, mate. Thanks for the continued support. But Much appreciated, for, especially for this, um, you know, support as well. And uh, he's also gone for the uh, the top tier. So he's the lucky soul that will actually be watching the video recording <laughs> for the first time. He is. He is. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because we are actually recording video right now. We are as we so, speak. Uh, yeah. So he, uh, MK Ultra. MK Ultra has certainly gone for the King Rambler. So that's, to that's... break it down for you guys, uh, we've got two tiers. Uh, we've got the Rambler tier, which is four pound a month. And with that, you get a shout out at the start of every episode, whether that's your username or your given name, whatever it is you want to choose. Yeah. I think we'll go for like the username to start off with. But if you're happy for us to use your, your full name, just put a little note in there, yeah, whatever need absolutely. be. Um, and you also get early access to our bi-weekly episodes as well. Yes. Um, but the one that MK Ultra has gone for, uh, they've gone for the six pound a month. You, you, you still get your, your shout out. Um, at the beginning of every episode, you get your early access to the bi-weekly episodes and you also get access to the raw video footage of every recording that we do. Yep. So <laughs> MK Ultra is going to get to see all of this, this and all of right. that. <laughs> <laughs> like and, we should be paying him. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, absolutely. We really should be. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that's... Uh, that, that's probably the best way that you could um, help support your favourite podcast. Come give uh, Cryptid Ramblers podcast a search on Patreon. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we'll put links in our in our social stuff as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but there is also another way that they could 
help support the podcast Callum there is indeed yes we've also as you've probably seen on the socials uh, teasing a merch store um now we were both quite reluctant to uh launch it as live um yep this is for MK benefit yeah <laughs> I heart West Virginia baby absolutely um, let's go <laughs> only speaking the truth of course <laughs> Um, yeah, so we were reluctant to actually make the store live until we'd actually tested the quality ourselves. So modelled mm. by Scott and myself currently, we've got two of the uh, T-shirts or prints that we've currently come up with. And I think it's safe to say that we're both really happy with the, uh, the quality yeah. and the feel of the prints. So um, we're also sort of happy to announce here that uh, in the coming days we will be setting the merch store um, to live basically so the, yes. the items will be available to uh to purchase from the store and um yeah like with the patreon we'll share you know sort of some examples and some links to the actual store itself and uh yeah and hopefully you'll enjoy what's um what's on there i'm certainly loving the uh Indeed. the i heart west virginia um yeah t-shirt. It is a yeah. personal favorite i'm loving this as well yeah so, so the uh, the other yeah. design that we've got for anyone that can't see us right now um so we've got the big i heart west virginia across the the t-shirt we've got various different colors as well yeah. um and then we've also got the uh, the logo with the woodland background the creepy sort yeah. of setup um again you can get these on your t-shirts we've got hoodies going there um we've even gone very pc and you guys can even get face masks with them as well yeah. um Absolutely. there's mugs there's a mobile phone cases as well uh, both android and uh, sorry samsung and apple yeah. um but yeah we're really quite excited to yeah. to get this out as stuff i'm sure you really can hear good, so uh, yeah yeah we really like yeah the stuff but, like, if there, if, so. if the quality of the other stuff that they've got and there's anything to go by with what we've received so far mm. then really really happy to bring this to you guys yeah really happy yeah yeah we thought it was only fair that we uh yeah sort of purchased our own merch first to give it a, a test run before putting it out to the masses and yeah as i say we're or as we say you know we are happy with the the quality and the you know the feel of the uh the t-shirt so um yeah we're happy to put it out to you guys so and the good thing is as well we've got um the suppliers work they operate both in europe and in the united states as well so if we yes, do have any absolutely. stateside listeners that are interested in getting uh, some yeah. merch you won't have to wait weeks and weeks and weeks for no. it no, there's a supplier as, uh, in your neck of the woods yeah so to speak yeah absolutely. Um, absolutely. and uh <laughs> so it won't be huge lead times i think out these came in within a week for us yeah just shy of, of, week, actually, of ordering think, them. yeah which wasn't um yeah yeah which wasn't bad at all and yeah i'm yeah really happy with uh with mine so uh yes yeah, so that's another another sort of positive so hopefully um some of you will enjoy the the stuff that's out there so um yeah, and, you know, and if any of you do, then uh, we'd love to see you in it. If it's a hoodie or a T-shirt or, you know, a, a coffee mug for when you're back in the office, then we'd love to uh, see you with it. So, uh, yeah, yeah, sort of tag us in your pictures or email them over to us on the, uh, you know, on the, on the socials. Do um, a bit of modelling for us, guys. Absolutely. And uh, like, you know, everything else, one more little teaser um before we actually jump into the uh mm. episode um we've actually had an encounter um sent in to us um oh but interestingly not from a listener of the uh the podcast um it okay. was someone um that my good wife knows um who is just aware of the podcast knows what we you know talk about and whatever and it just came up in you know, sort of general, you know, conversation and um, they've been willing to share the encounter with us. Um, oh, that's cool. Which, I th yeah, which I thought was good. So they've wanted to remain nameless. So uh, thank you to <laughs> this person for writing in with the, uh, with the encounter. Um, now it, the other thing that's uh, really cool is, is that it's about the uh, fabled Banshee. Um which uh, cool. is really cool because we've not actually yeah we've not actually had one as other than obviously what we looked into in that particular episode yeah we've not actually had an encounter of someone that we you know sort of know or at least are sort of aware of um, oh, excellent so yeah no it's really cool um, and the other interesting thing is that it it wasn't in 
it wasn't in uh, Ireland, Scotland, or Wales. It was actually it was in England from England, and hey! only, it's from England, and not only that, East London. <laughs> East, really? Yeah, Leytonstone, <laughs> East London. Oh, wow. Um, and so it, it involves a, a family. Obviously, the, the person that's written in her and, mm-hmm. and her family. Like I say, they lived in Leytonstone, uh, which for anyone who doesn't know is in East London. Um, now, the home they lived in um, was an odd shape, and they had an alleyway um, that ran from the front door of the property right down directly to the back door. Um, now the, the kitchen was sort of long and narrow and it was in an L shape with only one window. So to get to the back door of the house, you would have to walk into the kitchen, turn right at the window and basically you'd be at the back door, but it was only at this point that you'd be able to see kind of if anyone was there and if so, who it was, because if you looked out the window, Mm. it was, it was at the wrong angle to kind of see down into the alleyway, if that makes sense. Gotcha. So, um, yeah, so the, it was at the yeah the window was at the wrong uh, the wrong angle. Um, now I'm sharing that mo- mostly for context because it will become apparent later on in the encounter kind of why we we've sort of given that description. Um, mm. Now the the person's parents um, are from Ireland and are devoted Catholics. All children were young at the time, including the, the person that's written in. Um, it actually happened around 45 years ago. Um, and I think they would have been about three years old at the time. Um, mm. Now, obviously, being Irish, the family loved to talk about myths and legends. And, of course, from where they were from, yeah. they were there was lots of them. They were inundated with different myths and, you know, whatever else. Um, now, at the time of this encounter first being spoken of, certainly to this person's knowledge, they were in their late 20s at a family gathering. Um, and... So that the encounter was, was was shared, as I say, and it kind of stems from a, a, a family a family friend back in Ireland was um, you know was quite ill, but they, but they were more of a close relation. You know, like when you have one of those friends of the family who's referred to as yeah. uncle or uncle. Yes, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, got, the, the, the person. Yeah, was, got loads of them. To be honest, got loads of them in my mob. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I and, uh, and when I my up. family comes out of the East End as well, so. It, Oh, there you yeah. go. So it must it's, that, be a, it's that mentality yeah. sort of thing. Sort of a cultural thing of sorts, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it was a, essentially an uncle to, you know, to these children. There, there were five children um, aged between two and, and 12. Um, now, on this particular evening, the, the dad of, of the family had gone to the pub to celebrate a friend's birthday, leaving the five kids at home with the mum. Now, all the kids at this point were bathed and put to bed, and the mum was in the kitchen making a cuppa, or for anyone who doesn't know, a cup of tea. Okay. Um, now, she thought she heard... A cup of tea. A cup of tea, good sir. Um, now, she thought she heard crying um, from upstairs, obviously where the kids were. So she goes upstairs to check and quickly determines that all the kids are fast asleep and the crying isn't isn't coming from, from any of them. Now, as the mum is coming back downstairs... She says that she can hear the crying again, but it's gradually getting louder. Um, now it was not only was it getting louder, but it was it was then becoming a bit of a uh, high pitched noise, so quite a mm. really high um, sort of uh, scream. Now she's determined that it's also coming from the front of the property, and as it's getting louder, moving down this alleyway towards the back of the house, or you know at least the the back door. Um, yeah. By the time she get yeah, and by the time she gets down to the the bottom of the stairs, it's now this really kind of screeching, high pitched sound, which of course is we all, we all know from our episode on it is associated with the banshee. Um, yeah. Now, the mother was so scared because she knew what that sound was. She recognised it as death calling, or you know, death being you know apparent. Oh, yeah, okay. So she recognised, so obviously being Irish, she sort of heard this sound and knowing it wasn't the kids' cry and associated it with only one thing that that she knew. So she's walked into the kitchen, but she couldn't bring herself to turn out the window towards the back door, basically knowing what she was going to be, you know, confronted with. Um, So they were both out of sight of one another. So Mm. 
she was so scared that she ran back up the stairs. She gathered all the kids and she put them in her bed with her until the dad came home from, from the pub. Now, obviously, this was before mobile phones, so there was no way that mm. she could get in touch and tell him to come back. So she just had to sit and wait um, with the oh. five kids, you know, in the uh, in, in the bedroom. Now, the, the dad eventually came home about an hour and a half later from when this first happened. In the email that this person sent, she, she didn't confirm whether the how long the screaming went on for, but presumably it stopped by the time, you know, the dad... Um, the dad comes home but as soon as he does which as I say is about an hour and a half later he walks in and they receive a call on their landline and upon answering there are, they're informed that uh, their family friend or uncle to the children had sadly passed away and so wow. that, and that was obviously the gut instinct of, of the mother that she knew that something had happened or something was going to happen yeah. Obviously not not knowing who or when, she obviously wanted to grab all her babies and keep them with her. Of course, yeah. In the well, hope that the husband would then come home and it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be him. Thankfully, he did. But then they did receive that, uh, you know, fateful phone call, and it, it was mm. the family friend who had been poorly, and uh, she was being informed of his sort of passing long before they got the phone call. Um, oh, which, as we know from our episode, is one of the ways that the, you know, the, the banshee will kind of present itself to you you know it'd be you'd bring that that kind of message of death um yeah to either yourself wow or what a... so yeah so what what an encounter i mean you? that that must that to be honest that must have been absolutely terrifying hearing that yeah and really really not wanting to put, put your head out that window and have a look no exactly no and but... thankfully like I said at the start, you know, the, the context of describing that was so you knew, you know, that, that the mother could sort of walk into the kitchen, would be peering at the window, but then there would be the kind of the the offshoot of the kitchen to create that L yeah. shape, which would take you to the back door, which was also subsequently at the end of the alleyway. And so knowing that something was going to be standing there, um, yeah, she obviously she didn't want to didn't want to be approached. Now, interestingly, um, at the end of the email, cool. the person does say that. And, and this is why what I'm sort of likening to the reason why the mother didn't want to go to the back door is that they believe, mm -hmm. and I can't remember it coming up in, in our research so much because we had accounts of people actually seeing a, a banshee of some description, but apparently they, she believed. Like, yeah, like you, a spectre or something, yeah. Yeah, uh, but uh, the, the, she believed that if you made eye contact with the banshee, that you would in turn basically go pale, your hair would turn grey, and you would instantly sort of become, you know, a bit sort of, I guess, old and haggard, I guess, much like a lot of the... Almost uh, like that, that death has been put on you sort of thing. Kind of, yeah, or, or that ill feeling has kind of been, yeah, put on you, and, and that's how you then, you know, kind of show it. A bit like, um, for anyone that's not following, a bit like Medusa, you know, in, in that, in the Greek... Uh, legend where you, you know you make eye contact with medusa you turn to stone you know similar sort of thing you know you gotcha. make eye contact with the banshee you turn gray and old and pale and you know much like you know the mirroring her image that, you know I what guess. that is something yeah that didn't come up yeah. in any no, of that research uh, um, but it came up I mean, in, in this email from this encounter and that's one of the reasons why i think mm. the the mother didn't want to turn that corner because if it's what she believed it was which going by this i, I fully believe her you know, you wouldn't want to look out of that wind, that back door, and come face to face with you know whatever it was that was bringing you this message. Wow. So, um, yeah, but imagine being at home on your own anyway, but then with four babies as well, and and sort of experiencing that, and, especially when you know and what very it is. much, and especially when that's very much a part of your culture as well. And yeah, exactly. So it's deep rooted in yeah. what you know and what you believe and. You know, whatever else, yeah. But that one—that is, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's quite terrifying, really. Yeah, <laughs> it really a, is. No, yeah, one, yeah. So, I, uh, I, would, I wouldn't want to have have a look. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, nope. That's a no for me. <laughs> Don't <laughs> get uh, that. But like I said, they want to re remain anonymous. But just in case they do listen to this, um, just wanted to thank them for. Yeah, thank you very much. In and and without us. without giving away anything about their, their their surname or anything like that, is it a prominent Irish name? Yeah, to, until what I received her email, I didn't know what her name was, but uh, but yeah, I would say I would say that it's uh, an Irish 
surname. Like, yeah. Okay. Is it yeah. like a, a I wouldn't a say it's Mac or an O. No, no, no. It's not interesting. Oh, no, okay. But it's one that if you heard it, you'd be like, yeah, you could tell that they that they would be Irish without knowing them, sort of thing. Not Mur- so, it's not a Murphy, not is a, it? It's not a Murphy. <laughs> it's not a Murk or a, anything like that. No, but it's. I was going to say, it's like the English Smith. <laughs> You know, exactly, it's like yeah. there's an Irish Murphy, you know. Yeah, it's not quite like that, no, but, uh, but no, th- thanks for again for writing in. That's, um, yes. you know, we, as we yeah, said, very much appreciated. We like those um, listener or non listener interactions. So, if uh, anyone yes. does have any, then <laughs> yeah. please feel free to write them in. You could be yeah. Yeah. anonymous, or we can, you know, we can we can read out your name if, if you so choose. It's uh, you know, entirely up mm. to you. But um, but no, thank you, yeah, thank you again. Our first for that. non-listener story. Absolutely, oh, well. yeah. Which is awesome. <laughs> really, we're still reaching people that don't even listen to us. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so we're making an impact everywhere. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so thank you, uh, thank you again. Um, and so that's enough of the the, the teasing. And uh, without yes. further ado, let's um, let's jump into the episode. We are, as we said at the start, jumping into jumping back into, sorry, all things Hellier, Kentucky for what is now our part two of, um, I guess what will be our, our little three part mini series. Um, yeah. And we don't quite pick up where we left off. Um, interestingly, um, season two, which uh, which we're now covering, actually kind of joins the team about 14 months after the filming of season one of Helia. They've gone through the edit and they're about a month away from actually launching the season, mm. the, you know, the documentary. Um, uh, so we're in December of 2018 um, and the, the gang have basically got back together to discuss what research they'd all been doing in that 14 month kind of off period, if you like. Um, and yeah, as I say, it was also about a month before Hellier season one was being released. Um, and they were, yeah, discussing kind of what elements of the case, you know, they wanted to cross off and which ones they thought were worth, you know, pursuing. Because at this point, I mm. think they'd basically determined that there would be a season two. So, you know, what rabbit holes were they, were they going to continue to fall down and which ones were they going to sort of, you know, ignore, um, altogether basically because i think i think what it was it was almost like a uh, like an idea of splitting up and everyone taking their own individual roots with it um rather yeah. than what they'd done in, in season one was they they all went as a team they in all these together, different yeah. directions in which and i guess it's, it's a smart move because they get to cover a hell of a lot more ground it's kind of you what know, so we do isn't it? i know there's only two of us and we, we've not had a case yeah earlier, it's sort but... of we research the same thing, but we go off on our own paths and then come back with, you know, with what we've found. And for the most part, we don't find was... different, different little nuggets of information. So yeah, they all, wholly, you know, it all seems to link up with the information that we yeah. find on these various different. Yeah. We end up at the same yeah. sort of conclusion more often than not, but we've just gone about, gone about it a different, you know, a different way. Um, yeah. Now, one thing that they discuss is, I think back in uh, 2015, uh, Greg and, when Greg and Dana first visit Helia on, on their own, they try to find David Christie's house. And mm. they think that they found it because from a lot of the descriptions that David Christie gave them, they found this one house that kind of almost ticked every, you know, sort of box, especially with, a bit, with the fact that at the time it had been, or it looked as though it had been abandoned. Um, yeah. And then, obviously, when they return in September of 2017, they couldn't retrace their steps and locate it. The area was far more vast than they'd remembered, so they kind of just forgot. And I think we we covered that slightly in uh, in part one. Um, mm. But interestingly, in this kind of off period, Greg and Dana had actually given Carl Pfeiffer, the director, a lot of their footage from their initial visit and from 2017, obviously, to edit mm. season one. And when going through that footage and, and, and the files, he was able to backtrack through the times that they were in Helia, drive, just basically driving around the town. And yeah. I think Greg and Dana ref, uh, referenced in part one, oh, sorry, in season one, that they, they thought their camera had died. And so they couldn't, they didn't get any physical footage of the house that they were 
referring to. However, in the tapes that they give Carl, he actually finds the house. Um, That's right. To the point where he's actually able to uh, track down the address of the house now, that they believe belonged to to David Christie, which is where mm-hmm. obviously this whole Hellier thing, you know, kind of started for for, for, for this team, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was you going to say, man? Yeah, the, the, gonna... the one thing that I was going to say there was the first time I remember this from the first time I watched Hellier. Yeah, that the house that they viewed, they actually they actually showed it. It wasn't blurred out. If I remember rightly, I think it's since right. it's first was aired, it's been right. blurred out. Um, I know it's blurred out whether it's or not it blue, would... because they say at the start that identities. And locations have been altered to, for, you know, for people's privacy That's and right. sort of protect people. So, yeah, yeah I but guess I when remember the first time I watched season one, yeah. it was like a black and white house, and you could see the yeah. shed, you could see the the basketball court. I'm and sure the porch that is, well yeah, I am yeah. sure that was the case. I mean, if yeah. they do ever listen or, or like to this, you know, any <laughs> yeah. of the team, yeah, maybe you could correct me. Or yeah, please do. maybe tell me if I'm right. Yeah, <laughs> but do. yeah, that would yeah. that, that, be fantastic. But yeah, would um, just. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, you're right. Yeah, so that he he tracks down not actually not only the house against all the odds, but he actually pinpoints the exact address mm. to the point where he sends it to uh, Connor. And for anyone who may remember, Connor Randall was the guy drafted in as the the sort of the more paranormal. Uh, investigator to bring his expertise uh, to the to the team, um, and he in turn actually drafted his sister Michelle um, into this. Now I don't mm. think he actually explains what her job is, but she somehow has records to uh, people's files or property records or something. So, yes, I think she works um, within government in some form. In some um, form, yeah. So she's able to access this yeah. information which the other guys basically can't. So she's quite a an asset to have, especially at this point. Yeah, very much an asset, yeah. Yeah, because she actually searches the address to see whether they can find um, the owner in the hope that they find David's name, which would then at least add a bit of credibility to the fact that mm. he exists. Because I think at this point, the group are very much of the opinion that that he doesn't. Because if, if listeners remember from part one, they actually try to track him down. Yeah, well, this is just it. They've, they've been able to... That's right, and they're looking for a David M. Christie. So having that middle um, initial is is really, really, really Quite worthwhile, important. especially when you're looking for people. Yeah, yeah, it helps. So they're very down, individual people it? having that middle. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah and exactly. um, um, what's and, really good is what they yeah, actually well, find. <laughs> yeah, she. So she finds the owner of. The, <laughs> um. So she she gets the name, which is David M. Parsons. Um, but they're initially looking for a David M. Christie. Now, one of the initial, um, not synchronicities, but connections that uh, that Carl certainly makes is the connection in in the name that so Christie being a surname that's kind of a derivative of you know Christ and you know and of religion, um, and then Parsons, yep. obviously you know a Parson a uh sort of like a what is a follower or a, a is it like disciple that that's right yeah so he sort of makes an instant connection between the two surnames just on that basis alone but not only that but the age of david m parsons also fits into the parameters that they believed david m christie was so they've got an mm. age that matches they've got a property that matches and they've got a name that kind of half matches, sort of matches yeah it's, it's very very close um and so that instantly just kind of bang sits there you know kind of minds racing the line they get that enthusiasm back don't they it, That's it, what that is. The, it gives them the kick that i think they'd lost in that sort of 14 month period certainly from how mm. season one had seemingly kind of ended that they it's given them that thread to kind of unravel uh, again th- this is the sort of thing that, because throughout the entire uh, series of, of, of season two um just the way that it's produced they yeah each car each time they come back to this moment 14 months after 
wrapping up yeah Helia mm. that they all it the, the the documentary keeps coming back to that moment so each one of them have yeah. gone off in these various different tangents yeah that's it. and it's like back to this point now yeah. is when they really really start getting that enthusiasm again that yeah. maybe that synchronicity we've actually we've got something. something that yeah absolutely and and the one thing that I thought was was a bit of a, a synchronicity yeah was actually um Connor's connection yeah to it all. yeah yeah no you're right yeah you know now um Connor as, as you said was the yeah. sort of the primary um, paranormal investigator he's the one that tends to do the double blind spirit box or yeah. what we've now come to call it the Estes method which is yeah. what they then call it in mm. season two now um Obviously, we know about uh, Connor's sister being in some sort of government position where she can look up yeah. these various different records. That's right. um, and it turns out that Connor, Connor's sister and grandmother have been doing a bit of an ancestry tracing research sort of thing. Yeah. And it turns out that his ancestor, mm. Joseph Hurlis, uh, who right. lived between 1788 and 1838, was one of the first settlers in the area that would later become Pikeville, Kentucky. Yeah. Pikeville, where they went to in season one and they walked yeah. around town hall and everything, yeah. talking to people, trying to get these records. Yeah. His ancestor was right there. Settled and there's even, yeah. there's even yeah. a creek or like a ravine no, it's, that's yeah, it's a creek. Um, named Hurlis, after his... Hurlis Creek. Yeah. Hurlis Creek or something like that, I think yeah. it is. So yeah, yeah. potentially those footprint photographs could have been taken in any one of those caves in that creek as well. Along that creek, yeah, which is yeah. which is linked so, to Carl. And he just so happens to have been drafted in to this group who are investigating this, you know, sort of phenomena. So, yeah, leading on from what you were saying about synchronicities, Connor finally had his own synchronicity and and that extra kind of pull or, or draw to this whole Hellier... Um, yeah, this this whole Hellier experience or, or yeah. you know, investigation. So, so is it just that, a coincidence? You know, exactly right. Right. Is it exactly? Yeah, it's not. Is it? It's absolutely not. No. Um, but, but following that, and obviously the information that that Carl amazingly managed to, you know, to kind of find out in that that sort of off period, um, the the gang decide to kind of basically see what traces from season one have also been left. Um, any kind of stones unturned, any kind of loose ends that they can also kind of try and tie up before progressing. Mm. So they give them more of a steer as to, you know, what direction to go in. Now, interestingly, the first thing that they decide to do is to actually email David Christie again, and also Terry Rist, who is, who was involved in the initial um, encounters. Um, and they email, the email, sorry, to David Christie, immediately bounces back which tells them that mm. david christie is no more he's off the grid he's off the radar and that's one to kind of cross off the you know the investigation um now they also email terry wrist and they leave it a good 20 to 30 minutes and that email doesn't bounce back no, which gives bounce. them which gives them that kind of that extra drive and incentive to sort of carry on with this because it means mm. that Terry is also still involved in this investigation and there might be a further involvement from him well, later on in, they, in the, the season. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, they even surmise that, because um, obviously there have been teasers being put out for Helia yes. as well and, and everything else at this point, and they surmise that maybe Terry's seen one of the trailers and gone, oh, oh it's all they, kicking they, off, let's get back need, online again. Yeah. They might need me or, you know, I've got something to share yeah, let's let's get back on the grid. Let's get back online. Um, I mean, they, they obviously they couldn't tell when the emails address started, you know, being used again. So it could have been any given amount of time. But the the more kind of, and I suppose rightly so, the, the more sort of cynical um, uh, sort of side of the group kicked in at that point, and they sort of thought, oh no, hold on, we dropped a Hellier teaser not too long ago. Has Terry? found it, watched it, yeah. and is he messing with us? And so has he come back online because he's going to start dropping us more coded emails or more coordinates and this kind of thing. So mm. it was good that they weren't, you know, sort of 
fully invested still they had they they have sort of got this kind of devil on their shoulder sort of saying no hold on a minute you know it's not all yeah. going to be believable or you know whatever so Agreed. I think that that's that element that they actually recognized yeah. that that was a possibility and they didn't just jump in with two feet and be like Terry Wrist exists and he's got in touch with us or he's you know he's read my email and yeah they, they, they yeah. didn't get carried away basically they were still kind of f- feet firmly on the ground and exploring all possibilities so that that bit I quite liked especially for kicking off the new um you know the new season um mm. for, 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 you know for this one it show uh, it definitely shows that the team isn't just like you say just ready to just believe you know that yes, they're exactly, at least yeah. still getting whatever information comes their way and they're still going to try and dissect it um, absolutely yeah which which in in a way is a good thing but also if you dissect it too much then what is it? It could send you off yeah. on you're not going to divergence that yeah the, yeah yeah because you could. But it seems down like the when they path. have done that but, exactly, yeah. but it seems like in from season one where if they had started going down the wrong path, yeah, a synchronicity would pop up and add another yeah. one to the pile, yeah. and or it would send them back on the path them, that they were supposed to be on from the beginning. So it's almost exactly it's almost like they're being kept on track, and if one of them sort of deviates off that track for a minute. A synchronicity pops up, which puts them back in the direction that they were, you know, supposed to be going. Um, mm. So yeah, so no, you're right. It's, it's that the, it seems to have been very concentrated. And uh, talking about having synchronicity that brings people back in line and yeah. such, the the one of the huge synchronicities that introduced a new member to the team was um, with uh, Tyler Strand. Um, yes. If you listen to part one. We talk yeah. about Tyler's uh, uh, involvement in in season one. It's it's very very small, but it's still very important. But pivotal at yeah. the same time, yeah. Because he's really close with Greg and Dana, it's kind of like it was a given to them yeah. that Tyler needed to be on board with the investigation yeah. as well, mm. um, because because of such a strong synchronicity bringing him into the fold in in a bit in the first place. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. it was that connection of the Mothman and everything else yeah. and the cave dwellings and the fella that he met with a book that was compiling a book about yeah, exactly, yeah. creatures in caves and the 48 minutes, 48 seconds. Yeah. All of that is just like, come on now, there's too many coincidences here to, for yeah. it to just be, to have no meaning yeah. at all. Tyler, to, mate, you need to be on board, mate, a, you know, so. Yeah, you got to get involved, son. Yeah. Um, now, interestingly, towards the end of, uh, the sort of the, the the start, the kickoff to season two. They do harker back to season one briefly, where Connor um, conducts the Estes method um, experiment, which we've now learned to know that's what mm. they certainly call it. I think even I think Connor even yeah. coined it. I think, um, and that he he references the fact that the name Carl comes up a lot, um, which for anyone who has seen it or you know, listen to, to our part one, that name does come up. Yeah. Um, now, at the time, the team initially thought that they were referring to Carl Pfeiffer directly, who's obviously the director mm. of the, the, the series um, and who's obviously a part of the, the team. However, he later finds out that it could actually have been referring to Carl Ardo, who, for anyone who's a fan of that whole ph- phenomena who, who has listened to our episode on injured cold will know that Carl Ardo was the first mate and best friend of the one injured cold. Injured cold. Um, now the name Connor also comes up in that same experiment, specifically when Dana asked the spirit where injured cold was. Now, of course we know um, Connor Randall being the guy also on the team, the main you know, paranormal investigator. But again, I know you and I, you know, sort of knew this. And for anyone who's listened to our episode on Injured Cold, we, you know, you'll also know that Connor is also the name of one of Injured's sons. Um, and so in, in that one Estes method, they've gone from thinking that, you know, the entity or the spirit was communicating with those two members directly and instead could actually have been referring to Carl Ardo and Connor. Yeah. So could they have actually now, been communicating with Indrid himself? But now this this is where it gets really interesting 
And this is yeah. something where that I noticed as well. Do you yeah. remember the, uh, you must do, you must remember the reading, the tarot card reading that they had right at the very end. In the cave, yeah. And, and specifically the hanged man card, where it's said to look at things from a different perspective. Yeah, because it was and upside exactly, down. Exactly. Um, no, the hanged man um, just means that in general. Oh, it just means the, that in general, right, okay. Yeah, so it was the um, it was the Ace of Pentacles and the Emperor that were inverted. Right, so okay. it means the the yeah. opposite. So the opposite. I'm not going to go into that because I've already done no, it. In part I've already one. done it in part one. Yeah, yeah. But the yeah. hanged man one is the one that I think is really important when you talk about this. Yeah. In that you're having to look at things from a different perspective. Yeah. So when you take into account the names of Carl and Connor, yeah, as well, and now you're having to look at it from a complete different perspective. Yeah. That's what they were being told through the tarot card reading. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Read of it what you will with regards to tarot card reading, whether or not you believe it or yeah. not. I think there's something to it, but yeah. they're being told in that reading to look at things in a different perspective. A different perspective, which is what Carl, yeah. uh, sorry, Connor was able to do, looking back at the readings from his own experiment and. Yeah, so they've gone back that. over that transcript and looking at the language yeah. used. and Well, and looking more into the injured cold story as well, and obviously seeing these names pop up, they had the suspicion mm. that they might have been talking to injured anyway. These names come up, and it's like, hold on a minute. If we look at this from a different angle or perspective, as you rightly say, it gives them a whole new meaning to that experiment, thus giving them a whole new meaning to the results of, of said yeah. uh, experiment. Um, and in that same... Uh, Estes method uh, test the name Stillwater comes up um, along with the word bridge mm. and at the time again it didn't you know sort of mean anything to anyone in the group mm. but again in this kind of time off they were able to determine that there is a town in Minnesota called Stillwater and they also have a bridge similar to that of the Silver Bridge in Point Pleasant now, we all know, again, from our Mothman episode, right. that the, the, the Silver Bridge in Point Pleasant collapsed at the height of the Mothman yeah. um, sort of phenomena. Uh, and interestingly, the bridge, almost of the same description in Stillwater, Minnesota, hasn't collapsed, but it's been closed down due to state safety concerns yeah. and the frailty of the bridge, uh, you know, itself. Um, mm. Now... This is this was the bit that kind of got me, and I, and I know you'll kind of know why, Scott, when I say, but it might also have had the same impact, you know, on you. But at the back end of <laughs> yeah. that first episode, once Connor's just, you know, spilt this to the, the whole team, which is enough anyway, you know, enough minds were blown during all of this info, Connor also announces the fact that He's, uh, he's learned through Tonya Derenberger, of course, the daughter of, you know, the infamous Woodrow Derenberger, um, that according to two visitors that came to her home, um, they, they confirmed that injured cold at the age of 92, Demo Hassan, a, a, another crew member, and Carl Ardo um, all died and perished. Yeah. Uh, together um, which yeah. for me I was like what? what do you, what, what do you mean yeah, he's yeah, died? That's exactly what? It. <laughs> what do you mean he's so, died? because there was no other so at this again, point there was no you know explanation like, there was no context it was like you know being uh, you know as I've mentioned before an aspiring author that was like the perfect like cliffhanger <laughs> yeah. like, to end something on because then I'm sitting there the like twist hold on what like you can't just no nah, you can't end it there <laughs> and so that, that yeah, that's what yeah. really I mean the, the finding the address of David Christie you know the names Connor and Carl and the yes. potential the potential switch in the meaning and then you know this announcement from Tonya Derenberger herself that's what really grabbed me at this point I thought okay mm. now we now I know you know no, I'm liking it. Also, is so. but also, it's, it, again, it's that same cyclical thing that's coming from season one where everything's matching up, everything's matching up, everything's matching up, and then yeah. dead one, end. Yeah. You know, injured Cold's dead. You're not going to find him. He's dead. Yeah. You know, there's like. Yeah, you pull the thread, pull the thread. Oh, we've almost got there. Wallop. 
mm. you get hit with something that can you know can completely throw you off the track or you know completely right, just, yeah, make, just make everything that you've just found out now essentially meaningless <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and and kind of worthless so i didn't necessarily have that thought initially my thought was just like i'm not oh shit like i'm i'm not gonna wow. lie like, i instantly hit denial at that point <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, no, he's not How, dead. No, no, he can't be dead. He can't be him. dead. Like, no, like I know Indrid Cole, you know, like <laughs> yeah, exactly, I know the yeah. man. We do an uh, episode no, on him now with BFFs or something, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, it. it's come well, from I... one source that you would have to believe if you believe the phenomena and you believe Woodrow, you'd have Darren, to believe you'd have to Tonya, believe Tonya if yeah. she if she says it. So there is that kind of. That, that one bit of the thread, right? And like, she's okay, and, and she it. has maintained the story through thick and thin as well. She yes. really has. Oh yeah, she yeah, um, credit to her. She's, she's stuck we with... mentioned this in um, episode three for Injured Cold that she has had various different issues with her family, um, being able to hold because down jobs and everything in. else. Be- yeah. yeah, because she's so invested in it mm. that and remained so invested yeah. in it that the family is just she's had various very various issues with the family well, because remains of this invested, story. yeah sort of to this day i mean the, the yeah. interaction the, you know this news was posted on her socials back in uh it was the back end of 2018 i think uh mm. so i think so i, I didn't make note of that but I think yeah well right. the, the, the obviously that the team are d- digesting that news that injured cold you know, could well be dead. And he's he was quite a recent figurehead that got dropped into this whole mystery. And now it's all been kind of blown open with the news that he's potentially, you know, dead. So, you know, and this was the cool bit for me, and you know, I'm sure you felt the same, but yeah, they then decided to embark on a three and a half hour drive from Cincinnati, Ohio to Parkersburg, West Virginia, <laughs> um, to meet none Ooh. other than Tonya Derenberger herself, or Tonya yeah. Derenberger both, and, and she was, yes, yeah, and she was obviously she was very she was kind enough to actually receive them as well because yes, um, it certainly looks like she's actually in a care home at the moment. It did look like um, yeah, or, or, or a sort of a gated community of sorts, but yeah, she was definitely in a, mm. a facility of, of that nature, and yeah, and she she welcomed. It seems like she's in. not completely mobile as well, so it seems like her health is deteriorated yeah sadly um, yeah but a fair old labeled, bit uh, unfortunately yeah and as, but as you say she was able to wel- welcome them in and, and and sort of meet with them you know and lucky mm. for us as well because you know other than her book which we both you know listened to and you know sort of you know various you know other interviews we hadn't really yeah. i certainly hadn't seen her on on camera so you know for me i was particularly um you know particularly excited but she, she starts off the um, the the sort of the interview, if you like, actually recounting the events of the evening when, you know, Woody first met Indrid Cold, and you know how her dad was when he first came home from the, you know, interaction, how he reacted, you know, what he was <laughs> like, how he had, you know, sort of walked into the home, um, you know, it sort of stayed with her because she specifically mentioned that her dad was just like vacant almost like he, he normally he would acknowledge her and pay attention to her when he returned from work but this time he just ignored her he walked past her you know blanked her as though she didn't <laughs> exist and just went straight yeah. for the kitchen where i think he knew where you know his wife was at the you know at the time and that that was something that in particular stayed with her about the encounter um yeah which i think just you know well you can you can only imagine as well that his whole world Potentially, has just been blown wide open. It's just done a free. It's just done like a one eighty on him, isn't it? It's just been turned up. Somewhere, yeah. You know? Um, and yeah, no, it was. Um, yeah, it, it was mad. So she starts off with that encounter, and you can see in her face like how disappointed she was at the time that she got blamed by her dad. And so it's a it's an emotion that's mm. stayed with her yeah. even even now. But yeah, yeah so it was it December twenty eighteen that the crew met with her. Um, but it was a month and a half before that that uh, she was visited by um, Connor and Connard uh, Cold, um, mm. the two sons of, of Indrid. And um, like I say, they, they visited her at her home to deliver the news. Now, uh, Greg New- Newkirk, um, one, of the, one of the producers of the, the show, um, 
he hit her with the question, you know, sort of straight off the bat, like, how did it happen? You know, did they tell you how how he died? And she, she basically explains that Ingrid, uh, Demo and Carl were chasing down a humanoid, both in, in their, their ships. Mm. Now, they collided midair, and upon impact, there was an explosion, and it, and it's believed that everyone everyone was was killed. So Ingrid, Demo, and ships, Carl, yeah. and also the, the humanoids on the other, you know, on the other uh, ship. Now, it's interesting because Tonya's mind, I think, was had already gone there, and I think Greg and the team's mind had already gone there because the next question, you know, sort of posed was, you know, do you believe it was a hoax? I.e the death you know do, do you believe it was faked or mm. hoaxed and yeah she she basically says that she did believe that it was a, a hoax and he faked his own death to essentially get him out of existence to you know give him a bit of peace and you know to get him out of the you know sort of public eye if you guess from those that are trying to communicate yeah. with him and search him and also to get away from the third order who you know well, I suppose if he's still isolated if he's and, still isolated, yeah, yeah, we don't. Well, we don't know what the the nature of the third order is. Not at the moment, either, no. do we? We yeah. don't know what sort of and if collective him, that it might be. And it sounds like they were keeping him under a form of what we would know as like house arrest. That you know that that kind of thing. Yeah, it is isolation. But I think that you know that the third order, who or or whoever it is, sorry, that who's involved, was treating it like a, a house arrest for his protection keeping him under the radar and i think mm. that had sort of you know sort of got to him so they she, she believes almost that like a julian be, assange yeah we were pretty much yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah pretty much yeah. Um, and so she believes and the the, the 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 gang seemed to believe as well that that's why he would have gone about you know trying to fake his own um you know fake his own death and i, I think they she alludes at some point to the fact that this was also done in part with injured training his two sons to basically take over from him and carry on yeah. his work and carry on his you know missions because you know his and legacy and his sure. legacy because as it's believed you know at the point of the recording which for us was what three or four years ago mm. you know, injured at that point was believed to be 92 he's now in his mid 90s so depending on how lanulosian's age then not He's quite well. Old. We did go through that. They yeah. they last to like 120, 150, 150 yeah. in Earth years, in our years, um, yeah. so, wherever it is that Lanulo seems to be. But he's been on Earth, so, for, you know, for what you believe, for quite a few decades. So has his aging process mm. been affected by the fact that he's been here? So is that why he's kind of passing on the baton to, uh, you know, to his two sons? You know, that that was certainly a thought that popped into my mind when she. Uh, mm. You know, kind of alluded to it. Um, now, something that was interesting, which I know you and I sort of picked up on, but certainly for our listeners who are starting to or have, you know, fallen in love with West Virginia as much as we have, um, yeah. Greg also asks Tonya why she thinks West Virginia is such a hotbed for yeah. uh, the sightings, the the high strangeness, and everything else that's happened o- over the years, also including. You know, of course, Injured Cold, Mothman, the Flatwoods Monster, and all of the, you know, UFO sightings to, you know, to name but a few. Um, mm. And she firmly believes that it is the Appalachian Mountains. No um, hesitation in her Didn't even think well. about it. Didn't stop. You didn't just ponder, like straight just, up. Bang. It's the Appalachian Mountains. Now, I know you and I mm. have mentioned this in previous episodes because like a lot of those um, encounters that I just mentioned, the Appalachians are in some shape or form involved. Um, yeah. So as soon as she said that, it wasn't a surprise, but it was it was cool to hear her, you know, um, you know, to say Make that, that connection as well. Now, really, it's, yeah, exactly. And the reason yeah. she believes that is because it obviously it's a heavily wooded area. So if you want to be un, you know, go anywhere unnoticed, undetected, yeah. you know, it's perfect. You know, sort of for that. Um, and also with the cave system that runs beneath it there are a lot of places to hide. So if they need to set up yeah. shop somewhere and get underground, then, you know, again, that's a perfect, uh, you know, perfect region for them to, you know, to achieve that. Um, and so that's what she believes has drawn them to that area, you know, specifically. Um, now they also, um, 
ask her to contact the two sons on their behalf. And although we don't see what they write, they basically write a letter to Connor and Connard Cold, presumably asking them to sort of somehow get in touch, um, you know, with them both. Yeah. Um, Because they ask, they even ask her, what's the best way to contact the Colds? Yeah. And she says, through me. She said straight up, yeah, it's through me. Through me. Um, Because it seems like they, they visit her quite often. Like um, for like, yeah. They, she said they came around for Christmas, birthdays, yeah. Thanksgiving, Mother's even Day. Mother's Day as well, yeah. which is <laughs> yeah. kind of cool. Um, yeah. Although it seems like it seems like the um, Connor and Connard yeah. are probably older than than Tanya. Technically, anyway. they're older than her, but yeah, but I think yeah. From how it's all kind of worked out, certainly by appearance, you could be led to believe that Tanya is actually. I suppose physically, she probably older. looks like the mother. Yeah, so she's become a sort of, sort of thing, a mother figure, she? you know, to them both. So, um, yes, yeah, so, and I thought that was, uh, yes, yeah, so, and I thought that was quite quite cool. Um, Although we don't get to see what it is that they they write. No, that's that. what I mean. Yeah, she she doesn't. They they don't share. All you see them write. If Greg writes it, and he puts to the cold family, mm. comma, and then he obviously goes to continue the letter, but they only show you on camera. Connor and Greg deciding what to write. You don't actually know yeah. what it is they ask or what it is that they write. So I don't know why that wasn't shared. It was also well, for, for some reason, but... Well, I know that it doesn't crop up at all for the rest of season two. Right. Okay. And there is there is talk about season three. Um, oh, they want to they um, do it. Obviously, now we're on the... I uh, think they the want to do... I think... Now we're on the Twitter socials. I I now follow. Oh yes, of course we are. So yeah, I, we follow the uh, the Hellier team: um, Carl, Connor, Dana, Greg, and Tyler. And it's you know we're obviously not the only fans of of the, the Hellier series, and so a lot of fans, it would seem, constantly ask Greg <laughs> specifically. Um, <laughs> yeah. Whether there is. Come on, man! You need to get a season exactly, three out there. There's you know, got to be. There's got to there be a more. season three and. It seems like it's going to happen, but Greg almost every time basically just says, it, it, we want it to happen as naturally as the other seasons happened. We don't want to force it. Yeah. We don't want to kind of go down a path that we're, that we're deliberately trying to go down. They want it to happen as, mm. as organically as the previous two did. And Which... so in the meantime, I think they're looking into other investigations until it feels right or until the right time. Mm. Then they'll come on to... Season three, but yeah, it certainly yeah, seems like they get another email from yeah, exactly from, from Terry Wrist or something like that, Terry or David, or, or another contact or or something. Yeah. Which it makes sense, Greg saying that as well, because there's a point at, in in season two where he kind of has a little bit of a, a an argy bargy, a little bit of an argument with uh, with Tyler, Tyler, because yeah. Tyler is he is the embodiment of enthusiasm. Um, he's, he's, he's got a real disease, man, and energy. that disease is called enthusiasm because yeah. he's just like, yeah, man, let's let's go, let's let's get yeah. boots on the ground, let's get out there, and let's like he's so. F- and there's then there's let's just do it. Let's then there's Greg, it. who's yeah. just a bit like, whoa, 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 whoa. this has freaked yeah. me the fuck out. Yeah, this has got like let's come crazy. Yeah, exactly. In the way that this is, this, I mean, with that, this bit actually happens a little bit later on in the season. It does, yeah. and uh, we'll get to why Greg gets a little bit freaked out as well because yeah. it does get that we will hella yeah. fucking freaky. That we will the freaky yeah. deaky indeed. Absolutely, but um, but yeah, so that that all kind of happens. They they go to Parkersburg, and I think whilst they're still in the area. Um, Carl, again, who seems to be on quite the run with, you know, sort of his research and, mm. you know, kind of where it's led him, basically reads back through the interview between Alan Greenfield and Terry Wrist. Um, the which one is in the from back the of book. The, yeah, Secrets of the Euphonauts. Secret Cypher. Uh, yeah, yeah, Secret yeah. Cypher of the Euphonauts, yeah. Um, which is in the back of that that book, which is, at the time, the, the only kind of written acknowledgement of Terry Wrist, which is kind of what set the guys on this part of the reason why they got to sit on this uh, on this path. Mm. Now, he, he basically uses the cipher that Greenfield gives us to... Uh, he applies that to the clues given in this interview to basically pinpoint the location of injured cold 
certainly at that point when the interview was conducted back in the 1980s. Um, yeah. Now, uh, there's various words and phrases which he does highlight and apply the cipher to, which I'll go over in, in just a bit. But the one thing that kind of blows it all open for him is that in his extensive research on, on good old Google, Carl finds an obituary found in the depths of the internet um, from uh, a, a woman who basically mentions a restaurant uh, located in the town of Ashland, uh, Kentucky. Mm. Um, so uh, based on that, and again, it's blown even more of this case open, the team decided to drive to Ashland, Kentucky and take a look around. Um, so, but just to well, explain to the listeners as to why they actually go to Ashland is because in in that interview that's conducted by Alan Greenfield with Terry Wrist, yeah, um, it seems like Terry Wrist drops some very not not necessarily very vague but vague descriptions as to the location of injured Cole. Yeah. So, where we spoke about before, where he walked up to the door and said, uh, "Mr. Cold, I presume." Um, just before that point, he drops in these various different yeah. um, hints. What if he's got to come to? Yeah, he's got it was he's yeah. got various names and phrases that he drops in the interview, which, when applying the cipher to it, basically gives you a lo- like a, a location, and mm. based on those various um, words and phrases, essentially brought up the town of Ashland you know, Kentucky. Um, uh, and so, yeah, they, they they go to the town, they speak to some uh, locals, they go to some of these various uh, locations and th- they don't really come up with anything at this point, but they, they go to the local library to basically see if they could go through old business records, old photos of the town, to basically see if anyone took a picture of this restaurant and the restaurant is believed to be the location of where they had a a meeting basically mm. um well we, yeah yeah between, it seems like the, it's almost like yeah it seems like they had um the the, the house in which Indrid cold was living in yes. was right next right door next door to it yeah. to this, so that's this why place it, called uh, the wagon wheel wasn't it wagon wheel that was it yeah yeah um and so Dana and Tyler are going through photos of the town during that period of, of the eighties. And they do actually find evidence of a restaurant called the wagon wheel in Ashland, uh, Kentucky. And then Greg and Carl separately are looking through the business records and they actually find that for a four year period, a couple did own a restaurant called the wagon wheel. So that at least confirms yeah. to them, um, Terry Wrist existed and that his accounts at least have some uh, truth to it. Um, now, they, they go through the interview at the back end of season one, which we covered in part one, uh, but they also go through it mm. again in the, the opening to season two, which is essentially the point we're at now. But basically, as, as Scott rightly said, that he mentions uh, the wheel or wagon wheel in the interview. And that this is where they believe that it could be the Wagon Wheel restaurant um, in, in Ashland. Um, another phrase that he uses um, is, and the dead. And the interesting thing is that these phrases or words are either put in brackets mm. or they're highlighted to, to right. sort of add, help add significance. This is, how, this is how he's able to pull them out of the interview and then apply them to the, uh, the, the, the cipher. So... The phrase and the dead is, is highlighted and they believe that that relates to the quite famous Adena burial grounds, which are located mm. uh, within um, Ashland, um, Kentucky, not far from where they were at the point of uh, looking for the restaurant. Right. A couple of miles uh, sort of the other way, basically. Um, yeah. Now, another phrase that he uses uh, is the words of the law and, um, and that they believe relates to a local council building, um, which is in the uh, the heart of the town, like the, the main that's right. downtown. Because sla- they're also in these small towns as well. The, the council main like, 
town hall almost. Town it's hall, also, that was it, yeah. It's also the courthouse as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so multi, that makes sense that it's of the law, that it's the law. Yeah. part of the courthouse as well. Um, now, the word letter was used. Now, this is the one that they couldn't really pinpoint anything specific to, but Cole believes that it could have been used in reference to the old post office, um, which they, they did actually find the building to um, yeah. on their walk around. Now, there wasn't anything else to suggest, but obviously letter post office that's kind of where they're it kind of makes sense and, it's, and it seems like as well that it certainly is a, a building that's a lot older than the, like the 60s 70s and 80s so oh, it's about 100 years if old the so. meeting yeah if the meeting took place in maybe like the 70s and like yeah. but the, the i don't know it, 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 there's no real um allusion to time in which um terry wrist met indrid cold but oh. we are led to believe that it was fairly recently in respect to yeah. Um, Alan Greenfield's interview, which was done in the eighties, in the eighties, yeah. So that's so, the time period that they're working with. But yeah, as you say, there's no specific time frame really of exactly when the meeting um, occurred, mm. which is why some of these things are, are open to interpretation. Which and and the word letter is really the only one. Um, that's right. Yeah. The will is you know we've already gone over. Um, All house of God is another phrase that is uh, that. That is dropped mm-hmm. and Terry Rish drops in the interview. Um, and they believe that this is linked to pretty much the only Baptist church that is in the town of Ashland. Um, makes sense. Being a house of God. So, you know, that makes sense. Um, yep. The other one they weren't too sure about was a phrase highlighted again, which was words and signs, which, according to the guys, is quite yeah. a known uh, or famous saying within the uh, Masons. It is, and yeah. And as you would believe, as uh, luck would have it, there was a Masonic Lodge in the town of Ashland. And they brought up a a sort of a map in the episode, and they basically had little dots on all of these particular Yeah, they pinpointed it. And they're all in a a sort of a cluster, you know, within a sort of two-mile radius, maybe. Um, Yeah, I would say, yeah, maybe the the furthest point would be the Adena Burial Grounds, which was much more south of... Of everything, and then uh, off to the east, uh, off to the that. west. Even the the lodge was tucked in over there. But That's right. The others were in a cluster, very yeah, very so small cluster, weren't yeah. they? The only other one which might have been a bit further further on in the opposite direction to the burial grounds um, would have been where the because the, the other thing that drew them to Ashland was the fact that they also had a Mothman encounter. Um, there was yeah, which was on the other the, side of the river, was, wasn't it? Which is the other side of the river. So in the opposite yeah, I forgot about that bit to the burial ground. So that was the other thing that kind of drew them to right. Ashton, Kentucky as well. So another sort of synchronicity in, in this whole bloody phenomena of uh, oh, incredible synchronicities, uh, which is just uh, nuts. If you believe in synchronicities, which I now firmly, uh, firmly do, this case is just full of them. I mean, I wouldn't be, I mean, the whole case is a yeah. synchronicity <laughs> in it, you know, in itself with everything else branching off of it. But uh, yeah, so th- so that he, we'll we'll try and sh- share something on the the socials, which is the excerpt of the um, interview where these phrases are used, and it, it's basically Terry Wrist giving Alan Greenfield the location of where the meeting happened, without mm. him giving the location. So he's basically yeah he's giving him every kind of roundabout description of where it occurred without telling him this is the town it happened in. So yeah, this is like, like this is like the zip state. code or something, you know. Yeah, exactly. You said right, it happened yeah. on this road, on this interstate, at this restaurant. You know, there was a house next to it. You know, there was a burial ground just opposite. There was a church yard that you could see from the restaurant. So he's given you basically the yeah. pinpoint without the exact coordinates, um, which I thought was you know sort of quite clever. And that's how Carl almost almost, almost like a cipher, you, almost <laughs> yeah. like a cipher. So yeah. and I think that's how Carl was able to seemingly crack it and determine that it was, in fact, Ashland, Kentucky, um, yeah. you know, where, where this uh, now famed meeting um, occurred between, yeah, as we say, Mr. Terry Wrist and um, Injured Cold. So whilst still in the area of, uh, of good old Kentucky and having met with, you know, Tonya Derenberger only, I think, the day before, all of this happening, mm. they decided to stay within West Virginia and go to our 
new favourite place in the world, Point Pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, essentially, I don't know this is the bit that you were particularly invested in or was certainly excited about, was that Connor decided that whilst there was a team they agreed, but I think Connor sort of come up with the idea of wanting to carry out a Estes method test. Hang on, before, before you go any further... There was a nut when they were still in um, uh, in Ashland. They had oh, okay. a synchronicity pop up, right? Oh yeah, okay. I know what you're going to say. Yeah, yeah. Go on then. Yeah, you know what I'm going to say. So this yeah, is yeah. another synchronicity that pops up. So as they're in Ashland, following these various different locations, and that first of all, they actually think that they may have actually found the location of Endred Cold's house. And the um, which unfortunately yeah. no longer no longer exists. Yeah. It seems yeah, like it's just a car park demolished. now. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. again, through Connor's sister, they were able to um, gain uh, plans, a street map, yeah. uh, old street map from the eighties. I can't remember which year it was, but it was it was from the eighties yeah. at the very least, and it yeah. showed that um, that there was in fact dwellings in that location. Yeah. Yeah, that it was, they it was, uh, were walking was, along, isn't it? Yeah, that's Which right. Yeah, so she found them and sent them over the to him, and they, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's like, yes, we know that there were dwellings in that location that we were walking along, going, yeah, this feels right. This, yeah. and that was something as well because they kept saying the vibe here is it felt right. Um, they were there, yeah, yeah. They kept talking about a feeling and a vibe yeah. and and everything else, and obviously Dana is a hedge witch and she's very much in. In sync with those with that sort kind of, of things. thing, anyway, yeah, definitely. But the synchronicity, yeah, that pops <laughs> up is as they decide, right? Okay, let's, right, we're done. What we can, what we can here, yeah. Let's, we're good to get going. Yeah. Um, the team are walking off in a direction, and Connor goes, "Oh my god!" And then they turn round, and he's like, "Come, come, 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 come see like this!" this. Yeah, and as yeah. they come back to the corner, he points down at the floor at the entrance to this building, and it says, "Parsons." In a mosaic and on in the floor yeah. at the building's entrance. Yeah. So I get that name, Which again, Parsons, Parsons, David M. Parsons, yeah. but also Parsons was also the police chief from the uh, Woody Derenberger's. Yeah. Yes, in Parkersburg. So again, Parsons is a name it's that keeps again. popping up yeah. for him as well throughout this yeah. story or investigation, what yeah. journey, whatever it is. Um, well, and it pops up again later on, doesn't it? In the uh, in the yeah. season, quite significantly. Um, but we, we, I think we touch we touch on that in what would essentially be part three of the the sort of yeah. series. But uh, yeah, it does come up that name specifically again, doesn't it? Yeah, we won't uh, get to that point tonight. Well, guys. No, God, no, no, <laughs> no, no, but I yeah. think not. But I, I, thought, know, I thought I thought it was worthwhile done, mentioning yeah. that bit as well before no, all done, yeah. we head off to uh, to Point Pleasant. No, no, good shout on that. Yeah, no, because that, that is quite significant, and as you say, it's another synchronicity which draws another element of the case to, you know, this this particular part. So, um, yeah, no, well done for that. Um, so, yeah, as, as we as we were saying, um, the team, whilst in West Virginia, wanted to make a quick trip over to Point Pleasant, and they'd agreed that they would do uh, an Estes method. Uh, test yeah um but whilst doing that they wanted to combine that with the uh double blind spirit box and basically do the two back to back well was well the the, the estes method uh well this is just it where what we was referring to in season one as the double blind spirit box yeah is what they have started calling yeah, cool. the estes method yeah and um so this this I think that we might as well refer to that as the Estes method now. But what they wanted to do was they wanted to combine it with um, another experiment, another uh, apparatus that's known as the God helmet. Oh, yeah, and that's right. yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's um, it's a very very interesting setup. Now, the God helmet is a <laughs> it, it, it's a very um, grandiose name. For what it is and you'd yeah. expect this very elaborate piece of equipment and really what it consists of is a headband with 16 magnets on it electromagnets yeah. on them um now I'll give you a little bit of a rundown as to what the the god helmet is all about it was developed by um a dr persinger and uh stan corrin it's also known as the corrin helmet as well yeah. um 
and is found to enhance psychic perceptive abilities within a, a laboratory studies. Yeah. So there's a few different studies online that you can read up and have a look at. So yeah. whether or not you believe in psychic abilities or latent psychic, psychic abilities, yeah. then it's worthwhile going and having a look at it. Yeah, now, the idea is that with these 16 magnets that are, are um, placed around the, the head on this headband, yeah. um, they're connected to eight different channels. And the idea is that they alternate in a, in a very specific signal, a very specific uh, rhythm. Okay. And the idea is that it's supposed to enhance your latent yeah. psychic ability. So, yeah, that's right. um, so in this particular time, this particular yeah. method, um, Dana has a go. Mm. And was uh, it, she, am I right? sorry to cut in. Um, am yeah, I go right on. Thinking that it was the, the God helmet, because obviously it was the, the Corrin helmet because that he co-invented it. But didn't yeah. it get its name of the God helmet from the fact that it was initially developed for religious uh, studies? Well, this was, well, yeah, correct. Experience, wasn't it? That's right, yeah, because what they've um, been able to find is people that have had um, religious experience or um, a spiritual awakening mm. um, under test conditions have had various different um brainwave activity yeah and the Increases, idea is yeah. to to simulate that with the electromagnet with the electromagnets yeah so so it's initially developed the, for that wasn't it which is where it got the nickname god helmet because it absolutely so within these laboratory yeah. studies they've been able to replicate what people feel when they have a religious yeah. experience whether that's a vision or a voice in their head or yeah or whatever it may be some sort of yeah. trance-like experience which um I can certainly attest to, yeah. I believe I may have experienced once or twice in my time yeah. through through meditation and, and, and such. Yeah. Um, but the fact that she also then goes with the blind as well. So mm. she puts the blindfold over. So again, to yeah. a sense of um, sensory deprivation, which is... It's to force it. Again... They say it's to force yeah. the sensory deprivation to kind of increase the, the kind of the signal or to increase the chances of, of having said interaction because the, the version that they they're using um i'm pretty sure they was specifically developed for paranormal investigations wasn't Great. it so it's it's uh, it's a variation of the original sort of god helmet that's right it is yeah because i think the the initial um laboratory one was actually an actual helmet yeah yeah um, that they would put on you whereas carry it this is obviously no, it no. Whereas the the they've it. almost got like, like they've got that the, the portable version of it, almost. Yes, well, um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And they basically the idea is that they link it up to a laptop, which initiates the, the sequence of the magnets. Yeah. Um, and this is something that uh, supposedly Dana's used quite a few times, so she's got a fair bit of experience. Yeah, that's right. With this. Mm. Um, but to enhance this particular experiment even further, Connor gets on with the Estes method, so the, the double blind spirit box. That's it. Again, Connor, as we know, has done hundreds, possibly thousands of uh, of, of, of these Estes method experiments, and is yeah. you know quite well versed and quite well attuned to it as well, which yeah. becomes quite apparent by the end of it. Um, now, I haven't got a, a huge transcript of what actually goes down but it's really really interesting what goes down isn't it it is i it mean is. The, the reason why you've probably not got a transcript is, is for probably the same reason that i haven't and that is because that in all honesty for the most part there isn't really a great deal that, that does happen um no they, not to start off with no no not initially no i mean the, the way they set it up is that dana uses the god helmet um in the experiment so she can project the signal of communication in the hope mm. that the signal then bounces back to Connor, who's who's wearing, who's, who's doing his Estes method. So that they're, they're a, a, right, sort yeah. of a receiver, um, and then projecting the signal. So there's sort of two parts of the the same um, experiment. That's that's how they wanted to try um, to, to and use it. And they start so, it off with with Greg asking the questions, and he's they're not really. Yeah. getting anything back or you know no well, he actually starts up. asking the questions like it is just the estes method and yes. you know uh, 
there's a bit where I, fi- where I thought was quite funny, bearing in mind that Dana is Canadian as well. Yeah. There's a bit where she's sitting there and she just goes, I see a rose. And she must have said it quite quiet because Greg goes, oh, a you see a moose? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's like, no, like, a rose. Okay. <laughs> All right. We get it. She's Canadian. You're Canadian. We get it. Yeah. No need. No need to joke. I did. <laughs> yeah. I did have a little yeah. bit of a laugh when he said a moose. Like no, a rose. As if yeah. You can hear the impatience in her voice. Like it's the no, a rose. Yeah. Almost like he's like ridiculed. Her and what was said before. silence. And what was said silently was you fucking idiot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what on? No, a rose. Not but a yeah. Moose. <laughs> yeah. A moose. A moose. Yeah. A that rose. Did, uh... Yeah, like, me, and that, yeah, so it's a digress with that bit, but that that, that did that make me funny. that did yeah. make me laugh when but, I was watching um, it. But as but you rightly say, Greg um, was initially trying to whisper to Dana the instructions of the experiment, along with any questions that they wanted to ask as a, a group, and she would mm. then almost be used as a vessel to then project that question to whoever they were communicating with for then the answer to be given to Connor for him to then mm. communicate to the group. Nothing was really just, happening. Dana no, and Connor just... were seeing stuff and hearing, you know, various things in their own right. None of it really kind of synced up or, or held any No, it just relevance. didn't. There was no, nonsensical answers, really, that was coming out of, like, coming from Connor and, and, and the yeah. white noise that he was hearing. And yeah. that's when okay. Greg says, Dana, I think you should ask the questions. Like, literally ask literally the questions out loud yeah. because that might have that might have um created more of a a connection in what they were trying to achieve because mm. greg was almost creating an extra channel that didn't need to be there and so they could hone in the experiment maybe a little bit um mm. more concentrated without that other kind of you know outside you know influence if you like yeah um but prior to that point uh, i suppose it's worth mentioning the only real things that were highlighted by a more so by Dana was the fact that she saw, she said she remember seeing a gate um, mm-hmm. with a tall, long figure. Um, not that the gate had a tall, long figure, but there was a tall, long figure <laughs> yeah. in, in or around this gate. And then obviously... It was like the, the Playboy Mansion gate yeah, or exactly, something like yeah. that. <laughs> um, and then the rose, which also could have been a moose. It could um, have been a moose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Dana saw a moose. <laughs> exactly, yeah, then... Con- they, Connor then the, the, has like some random words, but nothing that really connects to what yeah. Dana was seeing. So yeah, as you rightly say, Greg then says, right, Dana, I think you should actually, you know, ask the questions. Um, mm. And you could tell that from that point, they are really then trying to, you know, communicate with injured cold, um, you know, specifically. Um, and well, again, yeah, there's think nothing the, really... They- that is the intention that she kind of puts out, but it's the moment that she starts asking the questions herself, um, that she's like saying them out loud rather than just sending intention out. That's when they do start getting some answers back. They do start and to sync up a little bit more. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, without um, completely taking everything from Helia as well, it's definitely worth going and watching it because then you actually get to see the almost back and forth conversations up. Like, questions being yeah. answered and yeah and everything and, and i do want to go into a little bit more about what dana has to say about all of this but whilst they're whilst they're having their back and forth mm. um connor says press three on the deck um yeah. which i thought was very interesting because at that moment greg is holding the tarot deck yeah um he hasn't cut it yet and no, and no. The, the, the card that's showing on top was the three of wands. Um, and that, that, so this is, again, this is where Sam, my fiance, got involved as well okay. because I only know a very, very limited amount of it and she's very good yeah. at understanding what each card signifies. And the three yeah. of wands signifies a journey. Um, almost like um, it's like setting the plan for the journey. Yeah, because um, the way tarot cards work is it's almost like a, a regular deck of cards. So you've got your one all the way up to ten, then you've got your picture cards after that. Yeah, and the idea is that it's um, a chronological order of what is happening. So the each each image has something that's happening within it. Um, okay. So he puts it. He goes, "Oh wow, 
you know, and then he starts doing the read. Um, I can't remember the question that she asked again after that, but Connor says uh, they were playing Ouija. I, no, I can't odd. remember the exact question either, but it was something around communication because they were saying, yeah, do you, um, she said something about how, uh, who's there or, or is anyone there? And then it came back and said, talk. To which she said, like, you know, we're trying or, or, or how. And then they come back with. They, um, they were playing Ouija. Yeah, they were playing which, Ouija. Yeah. Which makes sense as well that um, in that location of the TNT area with the domes, yeah. it is really, really freaky. So that would yeah. be the place that the local kids would go, ah, oh, I picked up this Ouija Let's board from Walmart, yeah. which is a really fucking smart move. Yeah. Whether or not you believe in it is not a smart no. move. Let's go exactly. and play with the Ouija board inside the dome, which is a really creepy location. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I suppose that's worth mentioning. because I don't think we actually mentioned that at the, the start of this segment, but obviously the team go back to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, but they specifically go to the domes located mm. in the TNT plant which is where the first Mothman sighting was made in, in the Well, it seems so like as, held as well time. that, yeah, absolutely. It seems like the, the, the TNT area was where Mothman seemed to be hiding out. Almost, yeah, because yeah, John Kill has his moment when he's driving past the TNT area where he yeah. has that freak out. Yeah, sort of that that stab of fear and anxiety that he yeah. tests by going back over it again, up and down feeling the road, it again. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, like it seems like the TNT area was Mothman's area. Um, yeah, yeah. So no doubt there's been plenty of kids That's where the over the years or, yeah. since the sixties go going there and doing the Ouija in those domes. Yeah, which, exactly. Yeah, you could probably argue that um, what she's doing there with the God helmet and the dome. It's kind it's of like a, Ouija, yeah. Of sorts, well, isn't it? I was going to say it's kind of like um, Cerebro from X Men. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly that, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it, really? It if you is. think about it like that, the, the dome structure it yeah. amplifies the signal amplifies along with these electromagnets yeah. on her head. Exactly, it's kind yeah. of like cerebro, like Professor X's cerebro. Yeah, that absolutely. Yeah. He develops in that. So yeah. I, I kind of made that connection like that. when I was watching it. I was thinking, that, well, that makes yeah. sense. It makes sense to me at the very yeah, least. No, it does now you know. say it. Interesting, I didn't make that connection but now you say it yeah it does make perfect sense that mm. yeah the the, the it, dome of the structure amplified the signal from the the sort of the god helmet that daniel was was wearing yeah. so yeah in turn it was like and cerebro yeah we were talking about um on our thursday call we was talking about um the significance of uh, sound waves and, and things like this and yeah. a dome is the perfect way to resonate sound yeah so if sound is one of these sort of signals that, that you can put out, then why would a dome not work with, say, a psychic signal, a psychic yeah. power, or psychic yeah. waves? Why would it work it for anything? Be. Yeah, exactly. Um, I guess, theoretically, it, it would work in a similar yeah. sort of way. But um, get back to this, uh, what, what, they, what they were doing within this dome. Um, it's, yeah. it's, Dana says that while she's communicating with whatever it may be that's channeling back through Connor... Yeah. Um, she says that they were communicating in a way that goes beyond words. So the way yeah. she she put it, because he says database, and that's right. She's she goes like like the all our languages are kind of like a, a database that is, is a lot of gumph in there, and the yeah. what they're trying to do is they're trying to condense yeah, a, a, was... a plethora of words into one word which yeah, yeah. Well, is something that does happen in other languages, like uh, Japanese and Chinese. They have a single yeah. character that has a that has a huge meaning. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I kind of felt that they what, were kind of... They'd almost try to... They were trying to create their own, like, Rosetta Stone for English. As you said, like, they were basically taking a lot yeah. of the well-known words and phrases that they had heard through their travels... They were mm. putting it into a database and then trying to translate what they wanted to say with the words that they knew, you know, in English, which is why random mm. words were coming out or a sentence but, that was a bit bitty would be coming out because they didn't know how to fully communicate, yeah. you know, what they wanted to say, basically. Absolutely. So, so this is the one thing. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right there, really, because that's that's pretty much what I got from it as well, mm. because 
what is also happening here is not just um, Connor that's receiving the audible signals from whoever, whoever. whatever it is yeah. that they're communicating with, but Dana is also experiencing something as well. So she's experiencing almost like the byproduct of that signal that's being sent to Connor. Yeah. And she says that they are, that they're communicating in something that goes beyond the words and it's condensing those words into, I think the way she puts it into a thought or a color or an emotion. Yeah. And she, she says towards the end, she, she says that their language is very beautiful. Mm. And I suppose if you're experiencing that language in a way that they, because she goes, um, can you communicate in English? And it said, and he kind of says, trying. Yeah. Now, this is something that um, uh, over the years I've, I've watched various different podcasts, listened to various different podcasts, and watched various different vi- videos about the nature of language. And this, the nature of language, got brought up in the the, the summary of of part one. Yeah. Um, and it's the idea that if um, if you took a, a lion, a, a wild lion, out of the Serengeti and it was able to communicate to you in English, you still wouldn't be able to understand what it is that they're saying because their points of reference are so far removed from what ours are mm. that language, even though the words would be English, yeah. the, the language would be completely different. Yeah. So they'd be saying words that, that they associate with different reference points that, that the lion would associate with different reference points. Yeah. And I'm using the lion being that it's a completely different species to what humans are. So the connection that I'm trying to trying to make here is, is if they are if they are communicating with an extraterrestrial of some sort, or even or even a post human, which is yeah. a potential, yeah, true. that maybe their points of reference are so far removed from our points of reference that they have to communicate with emotion and and colour. Yeah, and maybe just thought transference. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah, you because know, she said that because I think it started. Connor started he, saying he started he, hearing beeps and sounds like in a particular sequence, like Morse code, like Morse yeah. code. Because they ask, "Are you talking in Morse code?" And then that, that's when Dana makes the comment that they yeah. communicate with like colours and emotion. And, and mm. that's kind of how they were trying to communicate. Well, she, she didn't know how to translate those emotions or colours into what we would know as a tangible sentence or, mm. you know, something like that. So, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's uh, that that's what I found yeah. really, really interesting, especially after yeah. what I said about um, the forms of communication and, and how we experience time and everything else. And I, I remembered the title of that film, by the way, it wasn't contact, it's arrival. So if anyone does want to go and see it and understand what oh, sort of point right, I'm making, okay. go and watch Arrival because that is a brilliant film in yeah. that it just changes the idea of, of reality based purely on written language. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I've not seen that one. So I'll have to check it out. It is a good one. It's a really, really good film. Yeah. And and it does... It, I, I, I like to think that I, I use films as reference for a lot of different things. And yeah, um, I might be, I might bring up interstellar later on um, right. as we've kind of getting off the fence so far, but right. I'll get to that later. Yeah. Um, You've got a long way but to the, go. Again, the, so <laughs> we have, we have indeed. <laughs> so, um, so, the, so I'll, with this tarot card reading, so he decided, Greg puts down the, the the first card, and as we said, as we've established, it's a three of wands. Then he puts down the two of wands, um, and then that's the planning of a journey. Mm-hmm. And then he puts down the Knight of Pentacles. Now, the the Knight of Pentacles um, is uh, it represents like a slow, steady, reliable, but hard work and a long, uh, long work, hard work, long term. It's not going to be quick and easy. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of like my interpretation of it based on what each card represents. So with the three of ones being drawn first, um, signifying they're starting the journey. Yeah. But the two of ones drawn second might actually signify that they need to really think about the journey ahead. 
because the if you do go back and have a look at it, Cal, mm. then you'll see the the image of um, the two of ones, and there's a man in the middle holding um, what looks like a globe. Right. Yeah. So it looks like it's got like the, the planet Earth sort of thing, and that is signifying where on this globe this journey is going to be taken. Now, the Knight of Pentacles drawn last might actually signify the hard work and persistence that's going to be needed um, from this point onward and okay. that they're going to be in it for the long haul. Yeah. That this isn't going to be something that's done and dusted within maybe a couple of months. Yeah. This could be something that it maybe is going to happen organically over the next yeah. couple of years. Yeah. And hopefully, hopefully we'll see a season three. Um, yeah. But this also does make sense as well when you look back on season one, episode five, and they did that that last ritual. Mm. Well, the the idea that they may have been inducted into a ritual of some sort, because that's yeah. something that they were discussing at the end of season one. Um, that right. the, they were on the right path with the right journey, but mm. maybe they actually need to rethink exactly where they were. Yeah in order to go ahead and that yeah. potentially this is going to be yeah. for a very, very long time. For yeah, but the way, the way I sort of interpret it at that point in terms of that particular card being drawn at that point was, it was almost like for me, they were sort of closing off the Hellier Kentucky kind of season one sort of thing. So the initial yeah. journey, yeah, yeah. the initial journey took them on a hunt for, goblins in abandoned mines in Helia, Kentucky. But as we learn through season one, the journey yeah. gets taken in a very different direction. So when at this point, they're in Point Pleasant doing this, you know, these experiments and Greg turns that card, that for me was also almost the point of that previous journey ending. It's done. Like done, dusted. That's not even part of it anymore. Yeah. And this journey that they're now about to embark on has only just begun, which is why then when the second card is drawn and it's about the hard work and the longevity that they're basically being told, this is now the route you need to go down and you're yeah. not going to get any quick answers. You're got, you've got to be in this for, you know, for the long haul. Because if you consider mm. the point of us recording, they're seven years into this whole hell. Exactly. Seven journey. years. That's a long time. But at a point you know? of them recording, it was probably only three years for them. You know, so we're already, or three or four yeah. years, they were already th three years down the line from beyond that point, and they're yeah, still very much true. invested because they're st they're still all talking about a potential season three. So, yeah, for me, it was kind of like one journey ending, a new journey beginning. I think and, I think you're right there. Yeah, it's going to be a it's going to be a long one. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> usually with with like Arrow and everything else like that is if you're drawn the death card. Um, that's usually the, the death of one part, the, the, the start of something new. But yeah. that makes perfect sense to me as well, that yeah. this is like the at this point in their investigation, Hellia's finished. Yeah. And that makes sense as well because of the way they were feeling at the, at the end, end of, of last season. Like, yeah. yeah, I think we've closed this all off because... Yeah. We've turned up no I leads think, and whatever else. Yeah. I think it's yeah. well. They, they yeah, they find, kind of found leads, but the only thing that they've really been well, pursuing from Kelly was Sorry. David Christie, when which yeah. they found they um, David M. Parsons. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're still going back to the the secret cipher of the Euphonauts and yeah, the right, Terry yeah. Wrist from from that as well. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I think at this point in their investigation, Ellie has done and dusted, and now they're embarking yeah. on a new part that's going to take them in a new, new direction. Yeah, absolutely. And it's going to be, like you say, it's going to be for the long haul and it ain't going to be quick. It ain't going to be easy. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, st I still want to make a couple more um, points as well with regards to what Dana experienced with um, this communi communicating with whatever it is that she was communicating. Well, they're hoping with. it was injured cold, but, they can't yeah. guarantee whether it was or not, but they know they no. were talking to someone or to something. Yeah, whether it was an extraterrestrial or yeah. ultra terrestrial, or um, yeah. even uh, this 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 is a new term that I found out recently: a crypto terrestrial. Um, crypto terrestrial. Right, crypto terrestrial. Okay. So potentially the 
the goblins, the Hopkinsville right. goblins and the Helia goblins right. could technically be classed as crypto terrestrials in oh, that right. they are something that's been experienced throughout history yeah. that have always remained. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I think I've got that definition right, but that's a new one that I found out the past couple of days. Have, and I was yeah, like, that. oh, that's kind of cool. Um, I've not heard that before. Now, this something that was very interesting in the experiment that they were that both Dana and Connor were conducting together was that um, with the uh, God Helmet, what happens is that, that you put a timer on the, the sequence in which the magnets fire off. That's right. And they had set it to half an hour because yeah. from what I can gather that so much activity on the brain can actually have a detrimental effect, make you feel woozy yeah. and nauseous and everything else. That's, it's kind of like the old VR headsets, really. Eli, my, my boys just recently yeah. got one and I was, yeah. and I was doing my Maximus Decimus Meridius yeah. thing with uh, on it. And I was there uh, a shield and a sword and I was battling away for nearly an hour. And then I, came off and i was like oh dizzy and hell, yeah. felt, felt really nauseous but i guess it's something like too much activity yeah yeah um once dana's session was over and a timer had stopped and the magnets had stopped firing off connor describes a dip in the noise and the voices that he was experiencing within the estes method so this yeah. is after everything's done and um and they're talking about the experiment and the experiences that they both had and, and connor was like yeah yeah i i that's exactly, I felt it. I felt a dip in the volume and the, the frequency yeah. in which I was hearing the voices and everything, like, almost like the signal had stopped mm. being amplified. Yeah, um, that's right. So in conclusion to this, what I found, I, I don't know about you, but in conclusion, it seems that Dana had become like the amplified antenna for communication with another being, something that communicates very different, differently to how we do. And yeah. Dana describes it, it uh, the form of communication is not just understood up here, yeah. but like in her brain, sorry, I say up here in my brain, like everyone can see it, yeah, yeah. but just MK Ultra at the moment. Yeah, you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can see it. Um, so just not, not understanding the language in her brain, but throughout her entire body. So she yeah. felt it and understood it in her body. So yeah. it's the idea that you can, you feel love in your chest, you feel sick to your stomach, you're woke with worry and fear, and yeah. that your body actually is, um, is your mind isn't just your brain, it's your whole body sort of yeah. thing. And that's right. Anyone that is interested in following that sort of theory, check out this book. It's called The Extended Mind, The Power of Thinking Outside the Brain by Annie Murphy Paul. And just quickly, in summary, it explores the idea that intelligence isn't just confined to the brain and could exist with, at, within our own bodies. Um, like I said, love, in the chest, fear and stomach. It, Mate, you can get a gut instinct or gut feeling about something. You went all robotic. Did I go wobbly? You went all robotic yeah? then for a minute. I Did I go, uh, yeah. Bugger. <laughs> I was on a fucking flow as well. <laughs> right, so... I'll get back to it. <laughs> so you said about the extended... a quick summary of the book, and then that's when it kind of happened. Okay. A quick summary of the book. Um, it explores the idea that intelligence isn't just confined to the brain um, and could exist within our whole bodies. So, like I said, so you feel love in your chest. When you think about the, someone you deeply love in some yeah. way or form, you do. You feel it in your chest, almost like an ache. Um, you feel fear in your lower stomach. Um, you get a gut instinct about something. You know, it's yeah. it's these sort of things. And um, also think about when, if you've ever heard anyone about getting a, an organ transplant and their personality changes or they start remembering things that never actually happened in their life. Yeah. But they then confirm those memories when they found out who their donor is. Yeah. Um, I've heard about lots of stories like that, but it's an intriguing concept that's, that scientists are actually beginning to, to explore. So um, if anyone is interested in exploring that side of things, um, it is available on Amazon. I think there is an audio book and it's called The Extended Mind, The Power of Thinking Outside the Brain by Annie Murphy Paul. It's a really, really interesting book. Um, and it makes sense that that is a way of communication that our, Mind isn't just confined to our brain yeah. or intelligence, indeed. That you would know? make sense. Yeah, definitely. 
but yeah, I thought I'd just add that in because yeah. that was something that I came across and yeah. I thought it was something could validate exactly what Dana was saying. What those guys really. were doing, yeah, and what they were feeling and what she was hearing and whatever else. Yeah, so yeah. And even like the form of communication that the that whatever it is that they were talking to. Yeah. That they couldn't communicate with English, but it could only communicate with thoughts and feelings and colours and yeah. stuff that you would feel throughout. Um yeah. I guess that would be real telepathy. Yeah, I guess yeah, I guess it would be, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I guess it would. There was um no, but that's interesting though, man. Yeah, that is, uh, that is good. Um, so I guess just coming towards the, I guess the end of what we're going to cover in, in part two, um, you know, once they've, um, you know, been to, you know, Point Pleasant um, and they essentially try to digest everything that they experienced in those, uh, you know, domes in the, uh, the TNT plant, they then, send Tyler off don't they on a uh, on a sort of little uh, investigation of his own um following mm. the uh the coordinates um if you for those who have seen season 1 and for those who uh, listen to our part 1 in one of the early emails from Terry Wrist he provides an attachment which has the number 31 mm. written on it and then up the side are a series of coordinates and yeah. they basically determined that those coordinates lead to a point within um, North Carolina um, and specifically the, the Brown Mountains, isn't it? Um, the, the yeah, the Brown Mountain Carolina. in particular where yeah. the, because that they, anyone remembers, but they actually went to um, a cave yeah. in Brown Mountain and yeah. they always associated these, these coordinates with that cave. Um, yeah. Because they even do say in, in season one that it points directly to this cave. The it's on Brown Mountain. Cave. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't, but does it? <laughs> it doesn't. No. <laughs> they may have got a little bit carried away with that. They may have always associated with it because it's but, actually yeah. about a mile and a half away from the cave, and yeah. which incidentally is about an hour and a half, a, a, a mile and a half away from Brown Mountain yeah. itself. So, yeah, I thought that was a little bit of a, a strange thing that not as maybe coincides with what yeah. you were saying, where they were just kind of shoehorning bits and pieces into it. To a fit their uh, agenda, or they're getting a bit carried away with things, and they were trying to sort of bend yeah. it to make it, you know, sort of relevant. But they they do. I mean, they don't intentionally or consciously do it, but they do sort of determine that those coordinates, in fact, pinpoint to a location within woodland. Um, that kind of surrounds the Brown Mountains in uh, in North Carolina, and so they send uh, Tyler there because um, I think it's only I think he comments that it's only a, a three to four hour drive from where he lives. So I think that's why he yeah. nominates. To, I think the, to go these there. Americans, mate, they love a good three or four hour drive. They well, I mean, because they're three hours from fucking anything, aren't they? It's just... <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Besides, if we drive three or four hours, like, we won't even hit the the Scottish border from where we are. <laughs> no. You know, it's just. And no. they, they cover so much distance so in that time. Ground. It's, it's yeah. unreal. Because we get hardly any. You know, like just going from like a couple states over just to go. Yeah. I think it's incredible the, the it's way nice, they do yeah. it. It's, yeah. It's only, it's only about three or four hours away, one way. What? <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We wouldn't even think, tw- you know, we would think twice about it. They wouldn't. It's, no, it's, no they, yeah. for them, it's normal. They just rather have got the big, big muscle cars to cover all that, that distance, I suppose. Yeah, um, I guess so. But, uh, but yeah, they, they send him out to basically follow those coordinates that were in one of the original Terry Wrist emails. It's to uh, a woodland um, in and around the Brown Mountains in North Carolina. And he basically, he records, I think, on like a GoPro or something, um, basically his trek from where he drops off his car into the, the sort of the fairly dense woodland um, mm. to, to get to this um, point. He's got a GPS tracker to pretty much get him to the pinpoint exactly of where these coordinates suggest that they, you know, that they go. Um, so he, he trapes him through, you know, sort of the, the woodland, through the you know the bush and bracken and whatever else, and he kind of stops in his tracks almost because he hears he f- he can feel the ground sort of shaking and he can feel like a rumbling, you know, sort of in the air coming from you know sort of the distance. So he stops in his tracks and 
I think he sort of crouches or might even drop to his knees to kind of, you know, I guess, you know, concentrate on, on what it might be. And, you know, lo and behold, not too long afterwards, a helicopter just so happens to fly overhead at the exact point where he is at. And when you consider yeah. how vast the Brown Mountains are and this, you know, this particular sort of area, and a, yeah. a, a, a helicopter just so happens to fly over his, you know, location. And not just, you know, off in the distance, it flies it's over. It's literally his head. right over him. Right I mean, over. he even goes, oh shit, they know I'm here. They know I'm here. Yeah. Like, like that we all know who sort of thing. We know, all know who they are. Who they are, yeah. They, exactly. we, we, we know who they are, but we don't actually know who they are. Who they but are. They exist yeah. and they are about and they yeah. are watching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are watching. Yeah. Big brother is watching and they must have yeah. or maybe I don't know, picked up his tracker or or what, because no one else up really well, in the group knew that he was going there. So something has alerted someone. So well, he's gone to he very, doing. very specific locations, uh, very yeah. specific coordinates. Well, coordinates are only um, shared to Greg yeah. from Terry Wrist. Presumably there's no one else that he's aware of well, of these coordinates, you would presume. Mm. So Yeah, and it just that, so happens that the, he gets there, yeah. and he's not there long. No, not um, at all. And he, he finds some strange things whilst he's there as well, like actually in this... The, the vicinity of the, the, the pinpoint. Um, what he finds is yeah. um, this old, old shiny balloon, like a helium balloon that's inflated. Yeah. Um, and it's it just reads happy birthday. Yeah, that's right. And it's obviously it's very unassuming. And like, if we, for instance, in the UK, if we go for a little walk in our local woodland, we find shit all the time. Yeah. You know, like I, I remember finding stuff like that as a kid. Yeah. You know, Shopping like balloons and stuff and, like that, just yeah. to leave bits of cars, newspapers. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you know, blue magazines as well. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But yeah, but um, so but he's presumably in the middle of buttfuck nowhere, literally yeah, exactly, in, the, yeah. in the woods, and he finds this standalone deflated silver helium yeah. balloon with happy birthday written on it so in relatively good condition as well so it didn't really look like it had been there for a sustained period it looked like it only just deflated yeah because it wasn't underneath all the all the leaves or anything like that i know it was just sitting no. on the floor like on the on the yeah. ground um you know in in front of him and so, so you know to you and i the, that the good be... investigator as well that, that tyler is he goes Pick right i'm picking that up picks it up puts it in his bag and he carries on. It's because it's within about twenty feet of the actual pinpoint. So he continues yeah. to the pinpoint. Well, I wouldn't have thought, like you said, I wouldn't have thought nothing of it. But obviously, being the experienced investigator, <sighs> he does see something in it, mostly because of where he is, you know, his location, and the fact that something like that, by all accounts, shouldn't really have been, you know, found there, unless of course other no people had ventured. Notes it, the but, oddness of it. Yeah, yeah. but he knows. He that notes the oddness some, of it, and that. There's potentially some sort of relevance for yeah, exactly. that actual moment yeah. for that object. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Having, and, and having found nothing else um, to kind of keep him at that particular point, he decides to kind of go off the beaten track away from the coordinates, and he follows his mm. uh, GPS basically back out of the the woods. But he follows a path that he finds. Um, that essentially leads him to civilization that he hadn't necessarily come yeah, across. He, he loses his compass, doesn't he? The the compass on it his does, phone. It doesn't he, reconnect, so he follows a path yeah. that he finds that leads him down to yeah an area that obviously he didn't come to when he first arrived. And uh, basically, among you know, at the end of this path, he finds you know, a house and, you know, as you say, he's in, you know, sort of bumfuck of nowhere and finds this house. And so again, the, inve the inquisitive, excitable investigator in him um, basically draws him to the doorstep of this house and he knocks on the door and, <laughs> you know, lo and behold, a, a little old lady um, answers and they basically have, a conversation um 
But they, yes. she's quite open. She's quite welcome into the conversation, and she does sort of, you know, answer, you know, sort of his questions. But you know, much like the residents of Helio in the gang first turn up there, she's very kind of tight-lipped. You know, no, nothing strange yeah. goes on. You know, no weird sightings, no weird phenomena. You know, it's all like, yeah, you're wasting your time here. Yes, you, yeah. Because, you know, because nothing happens. Nothing. Well, the thing is, he says as well that he doesn't know what he's walking up on. And no. he just decides that with this whole thing, he wants to be as transparent as possible. And I think he does actually say that he just uses complete transparency when he's talking to her and says, look, yeah. I've been given these very specific coordinates. I didn't find anything there, but yeah. I wanted to know what if you've seen anything. And he gets the feeling that she was quite transparent with him as well. Yeah. That, he, he did you know, they, it was reciprocated at the very least. Yeah. Um, and uh, he... He, you know, obviously doesn't get any sort of answers, nothing, almost like a hitting a brick wall again. Um, yeah, much like they have done before with locals. Yeah. And then as he turns to to walk to back leave, up the path, yeah. to leave, um, he spots a carving in a tree. Yeah. Now, it seems like it's uh, the carving of a green man. So uh, for anyone that doesn't know, what a green man is it's um basically the woodland spirit the sort of um, the earth god isn't he sort of known yeah. as pan that's right yeah he's got various different names but yeah. pan being one of them um more so for the north american continent but he's always been known as the green man in europe yeah um and it seems like that with a lot of things over in the over in the north american continent when the europeans went over there they took a lot of their culture as yeah. well um and uh it's he it goes because at this point the green man is something that's significant hmm. to to tyler and he asks yeah. the, the the little old lady he goes is that a green man she goes no no just an old man just a carving of an old man which is a weird yeah. thing to say and he like it's almost like yeah. he rep, like imitates the way she says no no it's just an old man yeah, like he does say it quite creepily when he recounts the conversation. Yeah, yeah, Put an and emphasis I, on the old and the man. You know, just yeah, which is something says. strange because that yeah. doesn't. Okay, why would you just have a carving of an old man in a tree? Like just the face and the yeah. beard and and yeah. such. And it's almost like almost like the weirwood trees from um, Game of Thrones. That sort of thing. Yes, that's what yes, you would experience. So yeah. if you go in the woods and you see a carving of a face on a tree, the werewoods in Game of Thrones is supposed to be the wow. green man. Yeah, yeah. There's a that's a spirit that connects the yeah. forest to that. Uh, to, 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 yeah. It's almost like it's um, it's a way for the, the 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 forest spirit to actually see what's happening. So they carve these faces into the trees in order for the spirit to see what's happening. Yeah. Um, now, that's right. What he eventually does get back to his car, doesn't he? And he well, he does. Yeah. I mean, rightly so. With all of his enthusiasm and everything. Well, exactly. he's just like, well I've got to call Greg. Well, little, he gets on the phone. I think it's a little less enthused, enthused because he has that obviously conversation with the old lady and it basically creeps him out because he sort of thinks, well, yeah. It does look like Pan, but the way she's answered that is really weird. And so, yeah, as you say, he decides to leave and he returns, you know, to his car, but obviously he wants to call Greg, you know, and the team right away to basically fill him in on other stuff that, that happened, not only at the coordinates, but, you know, obviously at the uh, the house as well. And, um, yeah, he has, he has a conversation, doesn't he, filling him in. And um, here's a little... Here's a little tap on his uh, on his car window, doesn't he? He does, yeah. So he's, <laughs> at this point, he's pulled into a little churchyard and uh, he's on the phone to Greg and uh, he gets a little, little knock on the window. Yeah. And it turns out it's, it's one of the local sheriffs. Um, yeah. Plain but he's clothes, in plain clothes. Yeah. Plain clothes, yeah. So yeah. he's technically undercover, or off duty, whatever yeah. it may be. Um, but he's got a little knock on the window. He's just he says to Greg, stay on the line, mate, stay on the line. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> just yeah. stay with just stay with me. Yeah, like yeah. um and he, you know, he, 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 because it's uh, it seems like it's quite a small town, 
Yeah. Everyone knows what's happening. Anything that's a little bit strange gets called in sort of thing. And um, it just goes, oh, what you, you know, what are you doing here? And at this point, Tyler's like, I'm not going to be transparent anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I was geocaching. Um, That's right, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've done geocaching with the kids before. It's great. It's brilliant. Yeah. Um, but I clearly, Sheriff doesn't buy it, um, you know, and says uh, something along the lines of, you know, we've, uh, we always know when uh, strange men turn up and start asking questions. Have you got your ID? He's like, oh, okay, he gives him the ID. And he says he, he feels like he goes back to the squad car yeah. for quite a while. He's, got, he's like, oh, I'm a little bit worried now. They're really, really running my details. Yeah, yeah. Sort of thing. Um, they must have spoken obviously to the says, old you know, lady, come out of. What? Yeah, exactly. Well, she's belled it in and gone, yeah. oh, this, this, this guy's just walked out of the woods. He's yeah. asking questions. Um, and uh, he comes back with his, with his ID and says, uh, so uh, you are leaving North Carolina, right? And he goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going back to Pennsylvania right now. Because luckily enough, he even has it on his driver's license. He yeah. lives in Pennsylvania. So yeah. he's heading north, right? So um, he's like, yeah, you are leaving right now. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, definitely going. So as Tyler begins to leave, he looks over his shoulder to make sure the way is clear so he can pull out and carry on with his yeah. journey. And there's not just one plainclothes sheriff. There's a whole squadron mm. of plainclothes sheriffs in their behind vehicles. him yeah. in their vehicles. And they follow him, not just out of the town, but out of North Carolina, out of the fucking state. Yeah, to make sure that he leaves. Yeah. What? Why? What is going on? What are they hiding? Yeah, what did that there's old lady not like? Yeah. There's something that's happening there yeah, which is really, really weird. Like, why would the why would you just would, up and yeah? It just makes no. Well, I don't know how no far sense. how far from the state border the Brown Mountain area is, and no, or even what what, yeah. what this town was because I don't think he even he doesn't even say what town it is. I don't think um, he knew. I don't think he knew. He walked out of the woods, lost, and found a house, and mm. just thought, well, it's near to where I've just been. I'll try my arm and see if the residents kind of know of any strange goings on, probably to help corroborate, yeah. you know, his own findings, but also that of the team and ends up landing himself in trouble with the local law enfor enforcement yeah. because they think maybe he's up to no good or, you know, he's to explain for a lot of the strange goings on, you know, it just seemed that, a very odd encounter. I think what kind of puts the willies up him to begin with anyway yeah. is the night before he embarks on this little journey to the coordinates, Yeah, Greg and Dana finish up a live stream for their... Um, That's right. The Travelling Museum, isn't paranormal, it? Paranormal uh, museum that they've got. Yeah. That's it, the Travel Museum, that's it. Yeah. Um, the Travel Museum, where, where they um, were doing like a, a subscriber live stream. And yeah, they've got a Patreon up. as well. And they were doing. Mm. Uh, they they were, they just finished a live stream they do as part of their Patreon, where people can basically watch them do a talk about the latest goings on with the museum, the latest artifact they've found, and that kind of thing. And so they they finished the stream, and I think it was about quarter past nine at night at this point, and they received the first email from mm. a young girl who went by the who goes by the name of Amy, and. Yeah, she, well, she, yeah, yeah, go on, she go on, be sorry, I'll get really excited. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because she's quite, very, she's very different to David Christie in, in that she gives way too much information to Greg in this email, down no, to like her date of birth, exactly where she lives, her name, you know, she, she describes so much, you know, to him, but the thing that kind of, puts the willies up uh, Greg is the fact that this email comes in with the content that she provides the night mm. before Tyler is going to these coordinates provided by, you know, Terry wrist. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, there's, it's just, it's a, I've only got the, the, the sort of the transcript of her email. It's, so I don't have this kind of from Greg, but yeah, it's, it's the, the warning that she, it's kind of a warning 
to the team. It starts off as a warning. in there that really, really kind of puts the willies up them, like I said, and they yeah. they get a bit worried about it. And this is why oh, Tyler's it, on edge well, whilst he's in point, North Carolina. Well, yeah, because they they show it in the um, episode. Obviously, we've done it in the order that we have, just so it kind of makes a bit more sense. But Greg actually phones Tyler when he receives this email and explains, like, I've received this email. This is what she's telling me. Also, you're meant to be going to these coordinates tomorrow on your own in the woods. Greg was sort of given the impression that he didn't really want Tyler to go there. He didn't think it was kind of the right time and that maybe it should be put on hold, you know, because of these emails. Whereas Tyler saw it, certainly from how I interpreted it, but he saw it the complete opposite. He was like, no, if anything, these emails give us more reason to follow these coordinates to see whether we can actually corroborate a lot of what, um, you know, this girl, you know, says, I mean, she's in a, in a completely different part. She's not in North Carolina. No, she's, um, she's in um, Kentucky, isn't she? She's back. She, yeah. She's back in um, Kentucky. Uh, Somerset. 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 Kentucky. Somerset, yes. Somerset, Kentucky. <laughs> you're right. You're right. They're my top heavy lovely. Um, so yeah, so she, <laughs> there's a series of emails that basically you're back and forth. I think, I think there's six in total two of which are responses from uh, Greg and four are emails from Amy between, I think, nine o'clock in the evening to about three or four o'clock in the morning the following day, um, where she's basically just kind of like in a panic and like brainstorming all of this fucking crazy um, like information. But basically, I'll, I'll go through the transcript of the emails, just so certainly the first one, just because it's so weird. Um, yeah. So this is so no one knows that Tyler is going to these coordinates. This is just after Greg and Dana Newkirk have got off of a live stream um, from, uh, from from their Patreon, and they received this email, um, and it says, first, if you get this, and I'm missing, take note, it's euphonauts." I live by Halbridge Road, aka Ruth Community. So already she's dropped the, the pinpoint of where she where she is. Yeah. Uh, I heard a lady screaming bloody murder and begging for the torture to stop. I had run to rescue, found no one. I kept searching, stumbled on the unimaginable. Um, and it, an interesting sort of point here is that her sentences are very broken up, like that. Yeah. Of, Terry wrist, but also she writes unimaginable as two words. So the UN um, the un is in capitals separate, and then imaginable is a separate word. Yeah, which I, thought I noted quite that. I thought that was really odd. And that was a telltale kind of trademark of Terry wrist. Um, well, yeah, it's also what happens in the secret cipher of the euphonauts where the, the words are in brackets, they're in brackets, also in yeah. complete capitals as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so stumbled on the unimaginable. Time is of the essence, as now I am a target of the next ritual and sacrifice. Coral cave system. My name is Amy. My date of birth is, and then she gives her date of birth. But obviously, the guy has blanked that out. It's redacted, video. obviously, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm in serious danger, and no police will do anything as they are a part of this. It's government and extreme military cover-up. I found so much and there's no way to get it. Marine occult, cannibalism, human sacrifice, child torture, cave captives, and creatures, everything. The entire community, but the heart of your green man is here. I lived seconds away and never seen it or suspected it right under everyone's nose. And, and that, <laughs> which is just like, what the hell? That's, that's her first email. Like, which is just for anyone to get that randomly would be like, what the, f especially what? if you know that one of your buddies is going into a woods on his own. <laughs> and yeah. someone sends you that. Yeah, I mean, like, mind you, it is uh -oh. geographically a fair old distance apart from each other. Oh, it's a fair but distance this, for sure, but yeah, but this is you can understand why Tyler's already a little bit on edge. It's the content of well. the email and, as opposed to the location yeah. that holds the like the heart of alarming. your green man is here. Yeah, and he's well, he, a, a green man carving 
in a tree. And the police are involved. The police are involved. And he gets a knock on the window and they follow him out the fucking state. Not, not even just, just the town the, or the road. The town. Or, yeah. They make sure he leaves North uh, North Carolina. And and then also, you know, there was their, their helicopter as well. So all this kind of just throws Greg, especially into an absolute frenzy. He's just like, what is this? Oh my God. Like It's a whole new element. It's a, you know, it's a new communication yeah. from an unknown. So it's another kind of David Christie or or Terry Wrist. And yeah, you can tell by watching the documentary, it really does put the shits up Greg, um, yeah. who in turn obviously relays his concerns to Tyler, who for the most part is in typical Tyler fashion, he's more excited than uh, the nervous or <laughs> yeah. apprehensive. He's like, no, that's a, it's a reason to go. Like, I'm going, yeah. <laughs> which obviously we've detailed he does go. And this is kind of what happens. But having known about th- this email and then going, seeing the green man carving and all of that, now he's starting to be a bit well, apprehensive that... about what he could have uncovered or what he could have got himself involved in. Well, this was something as well that I, we haven't mentioned as well, but he did find something odd in that location in that he found what kind of looked like an exploded tree. So like a tree looked oh, like yeah. it had just gone kaboom. Spontaneously and, combust and or something, yeah. freshly done as well. So it wasn't yeah. like the, the, cause obviously if you see that something's been struck by lightning, you see the charred marks or anything yeah. like that. And um, kind of like, and... yeah. And also when the inside of a tree has been left open to the elements, it goes brown. Yeah. You know, like um, like an apple, yeah. almost. You know, um, and this hadn't done it. It was all like it was, no, it was freshly fresh. yeah. chopped up or freshly exploded. Yeah. Um, which uh, obviously that doesn't. We don't know what the relevance doesn't necessarily of that mean is. anything, but in, in the circumstances with everything else considered, and then that helicopter strange. going directly over him, him saying, "Oh shit, they know I'm here," yeah. makes perfect sense now because. Yeah. They know Someone he's here. Know he was there. Yeah. Whoever they are. Whoever they are. You exactly. know, it's... Well, there's. Um, I think that there's an initial response from Greg, which I think is just inquiring, like who she is. You know what what she's kind of yeah. talking about. I'm just trying to sound her out a little bit. And then around two or three o'clock in the morning, he gets another series of emails. Now this this next one, is, is a bit lengthy, but I'll I'll go I'll go through it. Um, mm. It starts off, and again, it's all bitty. So, if I'm reading it in a certain way, it's because I'm I'm following the the sort of the structure of the uh, of the email. Um, it says, "Wiccan Marine Occult." In July, me and my ex boyfriend were staying in a camper near the lake. It was very secluded, no running water, no electricity, nothing but nature. Me and him, and a few flashlights and beam ba- beam lanterns. Mm-hmm. Late one night, we believed a bobcat scream. Then it got deeper and began saying words, pleading for whatever or whoever to stop the torture. I immediately ran to rescue. My boyfriend grabbed me and pulled me back in, maniacally turning lights off and covering my mouth. He said, there's nothing we can do for her with no weapons besides getting ourselves killed too. I had to listen to her for the next 30 minutes until she grew silent. Finally, daylight came and I began the hunt, tracking and marking each track as I searched. I hiked to discover a cabin that I had, in fact, been familiar with for 17 years, but it seemed like I was seeing the cabin for the first time. Caged windows and doors, and not one, but two thick log chains and a gate across the drive with military-grade padlocks on the thick metal cage entrance. No way in. Mind you, I was determined to help, so I crawled in under the cage and went in against my better judgment. Beds were chained to rafters. In the attic, blood and feces stained the beds. Trap doors, booby traps, weird designs and human bones i found bleeding i found bleeding bowls human teeth bone carvings weird photos and a lot of paperwork they have a system they park cars at them and set timers for the power and then they tunnel underground faces in the trees i called the police and they all but told me they needed more I had nothing but breaking and entering to go with. 
I found that I now was in definite danger when I learned that they were performing rituals based on pagan slash Wiccan beliefs. I'm alone with no family or friends. All have been ruined by this craziness. I'm terribly scared, and I found that this entire town is a part of it. It's ground zero. The out-of-towners are members and the local elders, question mark. Well, they're all aware. Trust me, the caves and the caverns and the mines go from Virginia to Ohio to Indiana and Tennessee. I have a boat to take to the entrance, but I do not want to go in them again until I know I have backup that they're afraid of. The gatekeeper is the scariest of them all. He can actually perform magic. Trust me, I'm a sceptic. I literally began to suffocate as he whispered and blew me a kiss, holding this curved, weird walking stick and a crystal. Most everyone I know is involved, the CIA and the Marines and Navy. It is so insane that I almost didn't write you, expecting you to write it off. But I'm out of options and will, in fact, be murdered in these hills if someone doesn't help me. I've seen things that will blow your mind and forever change your reality for good. It did mine, and now I'm scared, alone, and hopeless, and I'm turning to you. Please, tread quietly. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I mean, what? what? I mean, to get that in the early hours as well, I mean, at any time is bad enough, but early yeah. hours in the morning, and that's an email that you get in response to your kind of who are you type, you know, response is just like, I mean, if someone's making that up, then that is awesome. <laughs> like, That's, uh, that is well, so do, do you know what he said? <laughs> like not maybe, you know, treat it lightly or anything like that, but it kind of sounds like Somerset, Kentucky is a bit yeah. like the town from Hot Fuzz. You know, it's <laughs> like Europe. the whole <laughs> Europe. It's all pretty great and good. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> which um, yes. I'm not making light of it, but that's kind of like what it sounds like. That there's oh, a whole community, a whole community of these, involved, yeah. To even yeah. keep quiet, and do you know what it to... sounds like as well? Yeah. Fuck, it now sounds like a hell of a lot like this Pizzagate thing that's gone on, like this, yeah, uh, that was yeah, hitting yeah. early last year, yeah, yeah. Pizzagate, Frazzle Drip, mm. the, the whole, all of those events. I mean, and, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I I got I went down a rabbit hole with that, as you know. Yeah, yeah. It was like I went went down some dark stuff, looking dark at places, the, the Peter yeah. Gate stuff. That yeah. So this for me, the idea that something like this, what she's describing, could happen, Is isn't that far fetched. It's it's not. Yeah. Her, and she does she does enough to give you a lot of info without really giving you anything at all. But there's enough breadcrumbs, mm. you know, through that dialogue or through that email. That, that that tells you kind of you know like what's happening without mm. completely blowing it all you know out of the water and you know and into the the mainstream but um so i mean this, that, this like, mate this is like, this has just gone we started wow. talking like, about I mean, this goblins was... and then and now we're talking about cannibals and human <laughs> sacrifice and Hello, you you're there? Back. Yeah, you back? Yeah, I'm back. All right. I'm back. <laughs> cool. All right. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah, you, you went just all... went there. All I heard was it's gone from goblins and it went in, um, and um. Oh, right. Okay. See, for me, you so, I don't know what's, I don't know what's happening yeah, there, man. Who knows what's going on? Oh, I mean, okay. But yeah, so, so but yeah, we thought yeah. this was all about goblins. In they goblins. are listening in. <laughs> they are listening. They're trying to cut us off. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's motherfuckers. It's, yeah, bastard. You think it's about you know goblins in caves in in a little town in Kentucky, and suddenly yeah. you're talking about cannibalism, human sacrifice, torturing, and you know st stuff that you'd expect in a in a you know a weird sort of cult horror film, not stuff that yeah. actually. But then you know you got to imagine people must get their inspiration from somewhere, and, and sometimes it's a little bit closer to home than what people realize and maybe this is a oh i understand yeah okay that. you see what i mean so it's yeah yeah i know but, exactly but what you mean i mean obviously it doesn't it, um, 
Come. It's yeah. Sorry, I just I it, for me when I listened to that again after last year and mm. and all the stuff that I did that I looked into with regards yeah. to the pizza cake thing that you could easily dismiss it all as ramblings of like a crazy woman yeah either a crazy woman or a prospective author or something you know that someone's created a story (laughs) that's just like just so we see it in films as well where they tell someone who that someone finds out about it and they're like they would the people wouldn't be, people wouldn't believe me because people already think I'm, I'm a crazy. nutcase yeah. or I'm crazy or or something like that. The, the, this story is so far fetched that they're yeah. safe in whatever it is that they're doing because a whole town wouldn't be in on it. The police wouldn't be on in it. There wouldn't be like a, a military cover up or anything like that. But yeah, exactly, obviously, yeah. we're not naive enough to think that human nature wouldn't allow something like that to happen. You exactly know, right, yeah. with the the shit that humans are capable of doing, yeah, in in the this pursuit nothing, of really. power, yeah, this is nothing. This is very much up those streets that that humans are capable of doing. So exactly, yeah, it's yeah. So when that that cropped up again, because yeah. again, that this was part of it because there was so much that happened with Helia that the first time around me watching this, yeah, it all got convoluted and bits got missed. And then when I watched yeah. it around second time, I was like, holy fuck, that sounds just like Pizzagate. Yeah, God was, damn. There, there was yeah. there was rituals. They are yeah. uh, sacrificing children to Moloch, the, yeah. the the owl god. This is something as well. Owls crop up a lot with yeah. all of this sort of stuff. Um, exactly, they do, don't they? Especially barn you know, owls, and, <laughs> yeah, but barn owls and horned owls and things like that. <laughs> yeah. But also, just to drop this in as well, um, owls are an I- archetype that are used for screen memories. It seems for yes. people that have experienced abductions, yeah. like they remember seeing owls at their window, and then when they've yeah. had a hypnotic regression, they've yeah. actually realised that they've been abducted, and those owls yeah. that they've they saw planted there, yeah, were greys, or yeah. they were planted there, or people have. Yeah. I had like giant cats standing on two legs and, and stuff like yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, this absolutely this gone just, way off now. Yeah, it's a complete head explosion. Yeah, it's way off now. Way taking the left field. You know, and this truly. was something that uh, Greg and Dana and, and uh, Tyler they held on to it for a good number of months before they revealed it to Carl and Connor. They? they did well. I mean, before we get to that, there, there were two subsequent emails that followed on from. from oh that yeah, one yeah, sorry, yeah. Carry I on. just um, went through. These are, are shorter, luckily, so I can sort of go through them a bit quicker. But the next one that followed, so that she presumably she'd been on a camping trip and you know returned returned home, and the next email simply said, "I can't go back to get photos of the blood, hair, and teeth. I have them actually in a secure location on." On two is a link. Three, the green man is a god they worship. I believe that they held their victims captive underground. You always hear the hum of the ground. Which was quite interesting because if you yes. remember, Tyler felt the ground rumbling when he was in that wooded area all the way over in North Carolina. Now that could have been a result of the, mm. of the, over, the, the helicopter flying overhead. But with the other strange goings on, and and these emails, from, the helicopter going over the top, yeah, yeah, could it have, could it have actually been that that he'd uncovered? Could then, it have been near the entrance of a underground torture cave or something? Absolutely. I mean, he could have been, and then obviously he knows about this by this point, by the point at which he's actually walking off into the woods. So, fucking props to him for still going ahead with it. Yeah, I'm not sure I would have done. Certainly not on my own, anyway. After hearing all of this, what Greg had to say with these emails yeah. back and forth with with this Amy overnight, and then by the morning yeah. he's in, yeah. or he's by the afternoon there. or whatever he's it is, he's, yeah. he's in North Carolina, and like he knows all of this now because he's spoken to yeah. Greg, and he's like, and he still goes for it. Man, that guy's a trooper. Like, exactly, Tyler yeah. is a fucking trooper. Yeah. Well done to you, mate. Big Absolutely. props to you. Yeah. But uh, like, obviously, he's still he's got all this in the back of his mind, and the significance of when he gets to that house and he turns around as he's leaving and he spots the carving of a green man yeah. facing the trees. Mm. 
he starts thinking, uh -oh. oh, and I, at the point at which she goes, like, oh, no, no, it's just an old man. You know, like, mm. he's he starts, his conspiracy cogs start turning. turning. Yeah, quite quickly. Then like, he's thinking, are these people part of it? You know, the, the green man, is it? Is, is, are these people part of something? Have I just revealed myself to them? Exactly, yeah. And then he gets a knock on the window from the police and driven out of the fucking yeah. state. I know I keep yeah. mentioning it, but the significance of that. Yeah. And why would he need I, backup as well? Yeah. This is this has gone full on conspiracy. Yeah. It turned itself on its point. head, really, isn't it? But well, it's weird, but no, but just to end up this uh, segment, there was there was at this point one final email um from Amy to, to Greg, um, which simply said you fortunately have been already on their radar significantly enough. I was told to contact you from a man named Doug. He said to make sure I had been in contact. So if I do get taken, it will further put them under scope. So they might be hesitant. There's too much in this location that they can't just pack up. I've seen them. I have been firsthand with the fact that it's U.S., Wolfpack, military, marines, a cult, aka euphonauts. I'm sorry I've nothing to show you. Believe me, I've had everything taken from me. I even had paperwork from the children they keep in the mines. Doug's real name, he asked, I didn't speak of. He says you know him by the warning. He won't mm -hmm. allow me to speak any more as emails are not safe. Neither is telephone. So could Doug, of course, be Terry Wrist? Well, that's certainly what they uh, theorise, isn't they it? They theorise, yeah. You know, because they don't know a Doug. They don't know a code name of uh, of Doug. So but that's they the only thing that they could surmise. And with the broken emails, some of the words, you know, split into two, certain letters capitalised, that was very yeah. much the Terry Wrist um, format wasn't Form of, it? that yeah, was the sort yeah. of go to structure of his communications. So, yeah, so they were sort of four emails received over oh, what, less than eight hour period, maybe 12 hour period, um, just oh, before tops, Tyler probably, yeah. went to um, the Brown Mountains in uh, in North Carolina. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just absolute madness <sighs> that. We started off with one sort of conspiracy, one phenomena occurring, and then you yeah. just get completely blindsided and hit for six, and it just takes a, a left turn, and you're just sitting. You know, I sat there thinking, "What the hell is just is going on? Well, what has happened?" It just, yeah. I mean, it, I suppose if you just take in all the individual um, attributes of this case. And yeah. put them out, lay them out on a pin board with your with your red string and everything, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. You just look like a jumbled mess. Like there is oh, there really is chaos. a bigger picture. And it seems like well, Helia was the catalyst. Yeah. Um what well, well, it even says it even says it in that it was the symptom. It was the it's, symptom. Helia was the symptom. It's not the cause, it's not mm. the 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 catalyst really yeah. it is just the byproduct of either the phenomenon or the mm. conspiracy that's going on. So, yeah, as 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 viewers of this, where do we go with it? Where where, do, where yeah. where's your thinking? Are you thinking that it's yeah. now more conspiracy rather than um, more conspiracy rather than rather paranormal than events? Yeah, could it be that? Because they realise, you know, not that I'm, you know, suggesting they're in on it, but could be, could be, could it be the case, sorry, that because they know that the whole Helia Goblins thing is done and dusted, is this something that someone they know has created to kind of keep them with something to investigate? You know, has someone keep them busy? This, yeah, to keep them busy and you know, to almost send them up the garden path with it. Or well, that is, well, you know what? Funny enough, you should say that. That is something that's happened a lot. Um, and they call them disinformation campaigns. Mm. And there is, um, oh, I can't remember his name, but 
um, it featured on Stephen Greer's latest um, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. Oh, okay. So where he yep. uh, Close Encounters, where he does his whole protocols and everything else like that, is yep. it's right. it's oh, I can't remember the name, but it was like one syllable for each name. So his first and last name has one syllable each, I right. believe. And he's been known to be a disinformation um, campaign agent. Yet he's still on the, the Stephen right. Greer documentary and everything else like that. I remember watching it thinking, I know that name. Yeah, That's where I know it from. So right, okay. this information, you saying that, is it's definitely not outside the realms of possibility that they could be being led down the garden path and straight out the back gate, yeah, potentially, exactly. with these emails that from Amy. Um, almost like, because now it's completely redirected them away from Helia, as you say. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And they're no longer looking at extraterrestrials or goblins coming out of caves. Or goblins or, yeah, or euphonauts. Even like her, her use the word of the, of that, the yeah. word. And also something, because you didn't say it, but she also puts the word slough in there as well. Slough is in, in her emails at some point. And um, unfortunately, that is a derogatory term for, for that, that comes from the Vietnam War. Yeah. And it stands for short little ugly fucker. Mm. Um and it was something that the U.S. soldiers would refer to the Vietnamese, uh, yeah. the, the Viet Cong, the Viet Cong um, yeah. as well. And, and But it seems like Terry Wrist has used that term yeah. for these goblin-like creatures yeah. as well. And it's now come so, up in her email, which is why they think that he knows her or, yeah. you know, because this dog is him. And, they've, and he's put her in, in contact with them, knowing that they're looking at, you know, Helia and whatever else. So it th- this is and, kind of the start. I mean, this is why we sort of end the end in the episode, you know, kind of here because it's, yeah. the, it's the start of a completely new journey. And a lot we were saying earlier, it's you know the the Helia Kentucky Goblins journey has seemingly finished, and you know this new journey is, is just beginning. And these emails really were the kind of the the bomb that sort of goes off with the group that kind of sets the yeah. new I mean it's a lot of the same kind of synchronicities and a lot of the, the the same events pop up but for the most part it's no longer about anything they were looking at before yeah because that's what Greg says he says this is Helia all over again yeah the, this it's is an, a new set he, of emails he like, on a right. new journey yeah he likens it to the David Christie emails that it yeah, sets exactly, them off. Yeah. Are they going on another wild goose chase? Yeah. And this is where, this is the point where both um, Greg and Tyler have that, that argument about. They have the spat, yeah. Because I, quite rightly, Greg's a bit like, I, I don't, I don't do like this. this. We're <laughs> yeah. talking about human sacrifice, cannibalism, yeah. torture, children being kept in mines, military cover ups. Yeah. What we get like involved in? Pagan Wiccan beliefs, which mm, yeah. you know, I won't say, won't say too much about that because yeah. mm, it's um, pagan Wiccan beliefs to normies out there yeah. is a very very wide range of things. Yeah. Um, whereas pagan Wiccan beliefs are a lot, it's a much uh, narrower mm. um, spectrum rather than what most people think of pagan beliefs and, yeah. and such. But like, even women being, like hearing women being tortured in the woods or what they perceive to be women being tortured in the woods. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. now for me, I did have, not necessarily a massive freak out about it, but I did have a bit of a freak out about it because of everything that I looked at with regards to Pizzagate. And this yeah. does tie into that. That's a scary thing. Mm. is that it's not just queuing on bullshit that's coming out you know where we go one we go all yeah and if some jfk jr didn't die he's still alive he is he is q and all this bollocks <laughs> like yeah. some of it's fucking mad mate so yeah. it's the some of the stuff that was coming out online this yeah. this time last year was just but for 10 i won't get you know, started 10 lots of like nonsense you might get that one nugget and you know, this could be one of them because we know it ties into other things that 
other people are looking into that aren't necessarily connected to well, any I guess, of this. So I guess you throw enough shit at the wall, some of it's going to stick. Something's got to stick, isn't it? Exactly. And so yeah. I think, yeah, I don't know if that's necessarily the case with these guys. I think they are following up on leads that they are given. But yeah, is it from a disinformation agent? Is it just someone having a bit of fun? Or mm. is it someone that's trying to blow open, you know, a massive conspiracy that's, you know, that, that's happening, at, you know, at the moment? It's um, well, this is the this is the thing, that one, that, isn't it? As well as one thing that I've um, that I've noticed with with regards to getting this far within the season, um, and the connections that other researchers have had that are similar to this now. At the beginning of season one, they do talk about the idea that all these various different researchers in these different fields, they don't talk to each other and no. share research or anything like that. It's, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, what I found is that people, oh, I lost my train of thought then. There's a connection. <laughs> I'm back now. I'm back. Yeah, there's a connection. Back. There's a connection. There's a connection. <laughs> between UFO activity, alien activity, but also esoteric practices mm. and um, and rituals and, and, and such. There seems to be that people are starting to find connections between people uh, documented um, esoteric rituals and, say, UFO flaps. Yes. So that's something that researchers have been finding that are outside of the team. Um, yes. And more so in the the ether mm. sort of thing, That's right. um, and I've got a feeling that that's where it's going to be going. Right. That's where I think it's it's going to be going, and I think the team are going to. I think they're going to uncover a hell of a lot more than what they might have expected. It's only what they bargained for, yeah. And I think, yeah, Greg's sort of initial fears certainly at this point i think are gonna be kind of justified i think with with, with everything that's kind of that blows up and you know with things that they you know with, with things that they find out people they speak to yeah. and you know the other sort of rabbit holes that they um that they fall down but um yeah we've we've deliberately yeah. cut it there because we thought that was quite a compelling quite a compelling point to um end that with those with and you Otherwise, you'll be sitting here for six hours, and I don't think you guys really want to do that. Otherwise, oh, yeah, so. you'll, be, you'll be here for another three, <laughs> three or four hours. So, uh, yeah, for time constraints mostly, but also because, yeah, that that seemed like a natural point to kind of just tease you with kind of, you know, another set of emails that the group have received, and you know the the connotations and the, you know, the the sort of story behind it and and what it could possibly lead to, and, and hopefully, you know, in the next couple of weeks, whilst waiting for part three. You know, and you know, and you listen to this, you can come up with your own ideas, yeah. your own theories of where it's going, and you know, and, and let us know, you know, because we've only, mm. I mean, I've only seen a little bit beyond, you know, episode five, which is kind of the point we're ending now. So I, mm. I still don't know the full extent of what they uncover, and you know, kind of where the season ends. I know Scott, you, yeah. you've got a bit of a better, well, you've got a much better idea because you've finished it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, th that's why we. Well, this is why it. this is why I'm like hungry for season three because. Yeah. And that's why I said that I think the team will uncover a hell of a lot more in the future, or yeah. they may even be uncovering it right now yeah, at the point possibly. that's recording in 2021. They could be doing it right now for all we know. Um, yeah. But yeah, we, hopefully you've, um, you've in, you know, enjoyed this as much as part one. It's certainly, uh, yeah, certainly blown up in our faces and, you know, taken a slight curve to the left with, you know, kind of where we've ended up and, you know, kind of the the, the, the the new stories that are, that are sort of coming to life so mm. um yeah we're, I'm and this is the thing we can't even get off the fence at this point no really, because there's nothing really to get off the fence with it's, no so it's a bit of a weird summary again a bit like part one it's it's uh. optimizing what happened and you know kind of where we are at, at this point and well i still think there are goblins in kentucky so there are yeah. still goblins in Kentucky, but <laughs> I, I think they've had to kind of leave that or put that on the back burner because they've yeah. opened up a whole other can of bloody worms. That now it seems like there's some sort of weird torture cult weird in cult. Somerset, Kentucky. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so where the hell does that lead? But um, but no, hopefully yeah, you've uh, you've enjoyed coming on this journey with us. Um, yep. It's it's been it's been mad. It, it's been exciting. It's oh, been absolutely. scary. It's been it's been a bit of a mind, 
bit of a mindful. I've got very excited about that, that's for sure. <laughs> I know you're getting excited, and I'm getting excited to finish it. I know I'm uh, only a couple of episodes beyond this point, but uh, yeah, it's going to be intriguing to kind of know where where it ends and, and kind of whether it ends on a cliffhanger, whether they get another set of emails. You know, do they 100%. do they meet Terry Riss? Yeah. You know, do they do they speak to him again? Do they meet Amy? Do they you know? There's just so there's much, too many uh, questions, isn't it? There's too much left uncovered that we couldn't possibly come off the fence at this point. So absolutely, yeah. So we'll so, uh, we'll end it there. So in closing, um, yeah. we'll remind everyone to uh, check out check in on us on the socials. Come find us on Facebook, Instagram, Please Twitter do. now as well, um, yep, and YouTube. Too. And obviously, that is the Cryptid Ramblers podcast. Yeah, come find us. Come and have a, a little chat. Um, thanks again to uh, MK Ultra for being our very first yeah. Patreon. Thank you very and much. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. <laughs> please come along and, and help support your favourite podcast. Yeah. Become a Patreon. Get Pretty to see our lovely it. faces. Yeah, um, come check out the merch store as well. well. We'll put our links and everything what we do, need to do on the socials. Yeah. Um, but for the time being, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. And remember... It's all for the greater good. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. There you go.